who've taken time out from their evenings to be here, so I don't want to keep you for any longer than necessary, although you're welcome to, to go the distance and stay with us throughout the evening. Uh, so with that, Mr. Kimball, would you call the roll, please? Certainly. Mr. Ankuma. Yes. Mr. Castillo. Here. Ms. Gill. Here. Mr. Lawrence. Here. Mr. Reitinger. Here. And Ms. Ward and Mr. Webb are absent. All right, uh, now we come to the next item, and that is the Pledge of Allegiance. Would you please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, next we have on the agenda... Uh, the adoption of the agenda. Uh, do I have a motion to adopt the agenda? So moved. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Ankuma, all in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? Or abstain? Okay, the motion passes. Uh, now we come to recognitions and reports. And our first item is uh, student representatives to advisory committees. Dr. Jones, do you want to have a word, or shall we just jump right in? All right, the first recognition we have is to our student school board rep, Mr. Dorian Charpentier. Is, let's see. Okay, um, we'll have to call out the uh, truant officer to track him down. We'll, we'll get that to him. Um, then Marina Allen Lewis. Marina, are you here? Okay. See Anna Dubrow. <laughs> Thank you. Welcome. Hold on. We've got a little sorting to do. Here is a certificate. Thank you so much for your hard work. Thank Appreciate you. it. And uh, you're not off. You're not off the hook yet. <laughs> Sorry. We're gonna. We're going to document this. Come on up here. This okay. is. Right, okay, just right jump right in. <laughs> Thank you. Thank Congratulations you so again. Okay, and then uh, next is Blaze Sevier. Is Blaze here? Thank you for your hard work. Okay, come on up. Thank you, Blaze. Good job. Well done. All right, next we have uh, from Esau, Lizette Amaya. Lizette? Okay. And then we have next uh, Yusup Shin. Esau? Okay. And last, right, we go. Min Sup Shin? No? Okay. Uh, wait, one more. One more. And then uh, Ermela Halermerian? Okay. All right, well, we'll get these off to their recipients. Um, I, again, I'd like to say what, what a great experience it is to have student reps on the advisory committees. I think that's made for a better system. I, I hope you all have learned something in the, in the bargain as well, and that uh, when the time comes, you'll be uh, participating on boards, organizations, and other things, and in part, we, we will try to take some of the credit for that. So again, thank you all, and uh, look forward to the great things you'll accomplish later in life. Thank you.
welcome Mr. Webb. Uh, the next item on the agenda is champions of character for the spring season. Coach Braven. Is your, double check your mic. Is your mic on? Thank okay, you. did that last time too. So thank you for inviting us tonight for our champions of character, which were chosen by their coaches for the spring season. So I'm going to have them come up and introduce themselves and tell you which sport they were chosen or which they were part of and tell you just a little bit about their season. Very briefly, so you guys come up. Hello, my name is Lorian. I ran the two mile for the track team. And if I could convey this season with an emotion, it would be appreciation for the coaches and for the student athletes and their efforts. Thank you. Um, hi, I'm Grant Goodwin. I was part of the George Mason soccer team. Um, this year we had uh, three great coaches lead us to another 2A state championship again, and we hope for another great season. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is Caroline Stryker. Um, I was part of the girls' soccer team. I've been a part of it for the past four years. And um, we had a new coach this season, which was new. Um, and it was, we had some growing pains, but we figured it out, and we um, won the state championship as well. And we'd just like to thank everyone for their support um, coming out to our games and all that. We really appreciate it, so thank you. Thank you. Hi, I'm Kareen Wills. I'm a hurdler for the track and field team. Um, it's been a really good season. Girls did amazingly well at States, and so did the guys. Um, and I just love the track community and family that we have, and I hope for another good year next year. Thank you. Uh, my name is Forrest Jones. Uh, I'm part of the boys' tennis team, and even though our team didn't do as well as we did in past years, we all stayed uh, positive and motivated, and we all looked to do better in all the situations we could. Um, hi, I'm Matthew McKeon. Uh, I played uh, varsity boys lacrosse this year, and um, although we struggled a little this year, our record wasn't as good as we hoped. It would be, um, I think it, it taught us all a lesson uh, in perseverance, and I think that's what we all took away from this season. Well, thank you very much, and uh, Coach Braven, any other? I'm just going to mention, just I know that you know the champions of character and what, our, what we look for in that, but I thought maybe... Everyone would like to know that we're looking for respect, integrity, um, sportsmanship, leadership, and responsibility. And these were outstanding athletes that we're very proud of for their accomplishments. All right. Well, thank you and congratulations, everybody. All right. Come on up and we'll get a picture here of you all with us. Do you think we can work them in up here? I think so. All right. Congratulations, guys. Well done. Uh, Mr. Charpentier, would you like to come and collect your uh, <laughs> certificate? You'll be marked as an unexcused um, or tardy. So come on up here and we'll get a picture of you. All right, next on our agenda is our work session. So we will jump on down here to the table and start our work session. No, 
Yep, that's good. Let's just wait one moment for Mr. Webb. And just so you know, they will use the podium as well. So I don't know if you want to, if you're comfortable. Okay. <laughs> just making sure you know you. All right, I, I, there he is, there's Mr. Webb. All right, why don't we kick off? Uh, Mr. Hills, we're going to turn it over to you. Um, I know the school board is familiar with Mr. Hills. He's our assistant principal at the high school, but he's also done a phenomenal job leading on our hybrid learning program, which is now in its fifth year. And um, we're excited to share with you kind of where the program is. And those of you that have followed the program, really four and a half years, over the last four and a half years, it has really changed um, in every direction that we wanted it to. And not only in the student enrollment numbers, but just what we're offering students and and the type of program that we have. So Mr. Hills, it's all yours. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and, and thank you to the board for allowing us to be here this evening. Uh, as Dr. Jones mentioned, this has really been uh, part of George Mason for about five years, uh, something that we've worked diligently on. Uh, our, our main goal for this program has always been to somehow find a way to individualize the curriculum and present it in a fashion that makes sense to our students. All right, when you hear the term used hybrid learning, uh, it's, it seems like a buzzword right now, but we, we're really part of what that means. And, and what that means is you're taking um, an, an online learning approach, blending it with a model that includes direct instructions by content specialists. And so it's not just teachers in the classroom that are delivering the content, they're also building the curriculum. We don't just have teachers that are working in our high C lab, we have specialists. We have curriculum designers, instructional designers, and that has always been the goal. Um, last year we started with four full-time teachers down there. They've been working diligently to uh, kind of fine-tune some of the courses, uh, create it in a manageable way, in a way that's interactive, in a way that works for our students. As I mentioned, individualizing the curriculum has always been our mission. I'm going to talk a little bit about that tonight. Um, but what I was hoping we were going to do, and we've been presenting here for a couple of years now, this year I really wanted you guys to have an opportunity to hear from our teachers, but more importantly from our students and from our parents to get their version of what high C means to them, how it has helped them progress, what kind of academic goals it has allowed them to achieve throughout the year. So today um, I've asked uh, some of our underclassmen as well as a graduating senior to join us and talk about their experience. Before I do that, 
talk a little bit about our mission and vision. So this is something we've been uh, really kind of working on for, for a couple of years now. And really we want to make sure that, as I mentioned, our curriculum specialists are able to create a plan that's based on the academic need of the student. What does that look like? Okay, so the, the, the best way for me to describe it is when a student is placed in a high C class, okay, one of the things we really want to focus on is we want to diagnose the student. Okay, so we want to take a look and say, all right, how can the student best be successful? Where do they stand academically? Uh, I'm going to have my teachers show you a little bit about how our courses are aligned, how our courses are aligned to upstairs, how they're aligned to our MYP and IB curriculum. But in the beginning, we always have to find where does that particular student stand academically? What does that look like? So once our students enroll in our high C courses, uh, a diagnostic assessment is given to determine where the student stands and where they should be placed. What we're really trying to identify our student strengths and weaknesses and what we're allowed to do because the curriculum is able to be manipulated in such a way that allows our students to be successful we're then able to identify okay here's the strengths here are the weaknesses let's create some goal setting plans that allow our students to be successful it may be something as simple as you know creating something that's tailored to meet the needs of the individual student uh, it may be something as Ms. Thrush is going to present to you in a little bit where there's a writing assignment in an English class and a student for example may not be successful writing on a particular topic. So they're going to work with that teacher and, and find out where their strengths lie and then from there they're going to be able to work on a particular assignment. Something they really wouldn't be able to do in a classroom let's say of 30 students. Uh, so that's something we've really been kind of fine-tuning. Our end goal is always to transform. As students progress towards meeting these course goals, curriculum is transformed to meet the competency or enrichment level. So the way I like to present it is you take a look at a long spectrum, right? On one end of the spectrum, you have the competency needs. So those are basic competency levels that we want our students to meet. And many of our students are meeting those competency levels through basic SOL tests, um, achieving higher than a 400 on an assessment. And we have many students that struggle. Our struggling learners can receive that kind of instruction in the high C room. But on the other end of the spectrum, we have something called the enrichment, the enrichment component. So let's say we have a student who wants to be challenged. Not only can they receive remediation in the high C classroom, they can also receive enrichment and the rigor of the course is something that the teachers work on on a daily, weekly and monthly basis to ensure student success. So this is really groundbreaking stuff. When you think about, you know, as uh, other schools are Fairfaxes of the world, what kind of online programs are they using to deliver content? They're using simplistic programs like Apex, for example, which puts a student behind a screen and tells them to do X, Y and Z. We are light years ahead of that. We want to continue to grow. We're not perfect by any means, but I want to give the opportunity for each of our teachers tonight to discuss what that looks like. So what I'm going to have right now is I'm going to have our teachers come up and they're basically going to go over what a student would see in a particular course, some of the changes that are made, um, how the course is aligned, what it looks like for the particular student. Okay. So I'm going to start off by having uh, Ms. Ms. Cynthia Thrush. Ms. Thrush is uh, serving right now as our English high C teacher, also is our social studies high C teacher. So she covers several content areas. She's duly certified. Um, she's been an absolute pleasure to have in the building and she does great work with curriculum building. So she's going to come up to the podium right now and she's going to show you a little bit about how the course is designed, um, the English courses for many of our students that are enrolled in high C. All right, good evening. Um, thank you for this opportunity to show this course to you. Um, we've made a lot of changes over the last few years in high C, so it's pretty exciting to share it with people and kind of unveil the mystery of what we do down there. Um, so anyways, first off, I want to talk about how the course is set up. Because we're in Schoology now, there's lots of different ways that you can set up a course. We're very flexible. So for instance, on the screen here, you see um, an English 11 course. It's set up by topic. That provides the most flexibility. We have an English 10 course set up by week, which students seem to enjoy. And then we have an English 9 course, 
actually set up by lessons, and one lesson is supposed to equate to a class period. Um, and we've done some polling. This is a work in progress, and students do prefer by lesson or by week, so that's what we're moving all the courses to. They like to know how much they should be doing in a given amount of time. And if they don't finish in that amount of time, it's okay, because they can work on their own elsewhere or the next day. Um, this also gives us a chance to modify courses. So as you see on the top here, there are two sections to this, section one and section two. And say we have a student that comes in with you know, a transfer or from another class, and he really doesn't need all three of these units. So we can put him in a different section, and instead of seeing all three units, I can view course as the person in section two, I'm sample student, and sample student only sees the two that apply to him. Um, so that's one option. Another option is small modifications. So let's say a student um, needs a different type of quiz. Everything we do in high C, every quiz here like a test, can be individually assigned. So I can edit and I can assign to a certain student or a group of students. If I want to assign remediation work or an extra assignment to a certain student, I can do that. And also as you see here, the one and two, I can decide, well, this student is more um, needs to do the thematic essay because that's a track they're on, but these other two students are going to do a medical report because that's more of interest to them and in their ability level. The other great thing about Schoology is that we can track student progress and they can track their, track their own. So at the top here you see student progress. Sorry, switch. Student progress. Internet issues. <laughs> ah. Oh my, that does not usually happen. Okay. Try this again. Student progress. Okay. Sample student. And as a teacher, I can see how much the student has done. And then the student can also see how much they've done. And they click in a folder, they can see that I've done these assignments and not those yet. So that's very nice too. Next, I want to talk about course alignment, because another question we have is, well, how are these courses like what you do in the uh, actual classroom, you know? So with the classroom, first of all, in English, we have a works taught list. So the works that we teach in high C are the same or comparable to the ones that are taught in the classroom. Um, for instance, in English 11 part one, we teach the same root words that are taught to the 11th graders in the traditional classroom. We teach Antigone and Macbeth. Macbeth is one of the required works for 11th grade. We teach The Stranger, which is another work that is taught in the 11th grade. So what the kids are seeing as far as content is very similar to what is seen upstairs. If you talk about MYP, we are absolutely aligned with MYP. These folders you see are the same units that the MYP 9 teachers teach upstairs. The way that I have set it up includes a statement of inquiry, which they use upstairs right up here in orange, narrative writing. That's our statement of inquiry. The lessons are all meant to have that same theme of perspective, that narrative writing allows us to understand char character perspective. And then when you go all the way down to the assessment, the high C classes include the high C uh, MYP assessment. So we have perspective narrative, and our students see the same essay question that the kids upstairs would see. And it's MYP aligned, it's in the graphs format, which is the format of MYP assessments, and it's no um, less rigorous than something that they would have upstairs. Sometimes it's even more because they might be um, more self-motivated and self-paced. Um, the other neat thing that we have is that we can align things to the SOLs. So if we go back to materials, and we look at lesson eight, You can see here that this lesson focuses on SOL 9.4 H and K, so we're talking about author style and literary effect and author specific word choice and syntax. So Casca Amontillado, you know, we're going to read that story and learn lots of different things, but we're going to focus on those specific SOLs. That's what the questions are going to be about. Uh, that's what this video, this is Compass content, will be about. And then the quiz, once students get here, I can align each question to a standard. So it says 9.4 K. H, etc. So most of the questions are about K and H, about syntax. And if you go to mastery, once the student actually takes this quiz,
and we have to set it to not MYP, but numeric. Back to section two. Oh, there we go. And we can see how students have actually done in each standard. Maybe. It's not cooperating. And then the other great part is on unit tests, you can also align everything to standards so that you can see the mastery of the students on particular standards as they take the test. And the nice thing about that is instead of a kid just having a C in a class, we can know why they have a C. You know, what specific standards do they not meet or do they need help with? And in high C, we can give it to them. Um, the other nice thing is course interactivity. We have all sorts of feedback available. So for instance, in lesson 10, on the quiz, if a student takes a quiz, even if they're not in the room with me for me to go over it right then, we have a way in Schoology to give immediate feedback. So see here, when a student submits the response, they will have all of these feedback responses come up. So just like the teacher is speaking with them, when they take a quiz, they get an immediate grade, and then the feedback pops up. So it helps them understand if they got it wrong, why is it wrong? If they got it right, they get kind of a good job, you know, that they've got it right. The other good thing about um, the way Schoology does things is that there's mastery settings. So instead of a child just going along a unit not doing so well, we can stop them in their tracks and make them redo something until they get it right. That works particularly well with things like grammar, you know, stuff you just need to practice to do well. So for here, you see there's like a direct and indirect object quiz and says must score at least 100. So if the child does not get all the questions right, it'll keep bouncing him back until he does. Um, and eventually he will get them right. But it allows me as a teacher to make sure someone's not moving past where they need to be. Um, another great thing we have is discussion boards, of course, uh, in Schoology. And we try to make the best use of them as we can. So for instance, um, in books, Chronicle, that's another one they do upstairs. Here's a discussion question. Making predictions, what if? Here we go. So instead of just responding to my question, I say respond to the what if question of the last poster. So they can respond to me and ask a question. And then she responds to him and asks a question, and she responds to him and asks a question. So it's asynchronous. They're not in the same room together, but they are kind of discussing things uh, quietly in their own way. The other great thing in high C, because we don't have quite as many students in English, we have the ability to be very personalized with essay help. So we use Google Docs. A lot of times kids come down, they struggle with writing. So I have them share with me their Google Doc before they actually submit it. So it's almost like co-writing in some instances, but I can go along and, and I'm not sure it's going to let me show you. Here it is. There's the comment. So I comment as they write. I suggest as they write. I help them to get started um, so that they don't spend two hours writing you know, stuff that is not correct, you know? And I think by modeling this for the kids, by having a conversation as they write, that really helps them. And I've had kids come a, a long way uh, in their writing by doing this with them. Kids who might never have wanted to write anything are all of a sudden doing it. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is just course personalization. So the kind of people that come to high C, you know, we have advanced learners, which as Mr. Hill talked about, you know, they start with, you know, whatever the base curriculum is for, let's say English 9, but we, we figure out pretty soon that they want more and they'll tell you they want more. So when it comes to projects, sometimes you can let them choose their own text that's more difficult. You can let them go beyond. Um, I had a student who I know can write very well. Writing is not a problem for her. Um, so instead of writing the traditional essay of On Mice and Men, she decided to write a research paper about southwestern creatures and basically the ecosystem and how the humans interact with the critters and hurt them. It was very in-depth, but like that's her interest. And she did very well on that. And honestly, she did not need to write a literary essay um, because I know she can and she was ready for something else. So that's an example of, of an advanced learner who we can modify things for. Uh, struggling students, of course, in high C, we can use the mastery settings to make them not go farther than they should. Um, we can look at the mastery standards to see what standards they need help with. And we have one-on-one -on -one tutoring. Any kid that's assigned a high C block, you know, 
they get actual one-on-one -on -one help from their teacher whenever they need it. So that really gets kids who struggle, I think, the help they need. Um, and it prevents, you know, child has a C. And if you look at the child's grade book, a lot of times they have a C because they didn't turn things in. So is the C really a good you know, indicator of what the child knows or just the child didn't turn things in? Um, that doesn't happen in high C because you don't finish our class till you turn it all in. You don't just, oh, time's done. No, so we're truly mastery content. And then I think the most important thing is reluctant learners. You know, those kids who you know they can do it, they don't want to do it, and they're kind of the toughest. Um, but we have what I would call authentic assignments and authentic assessments. I'm thinking of a couple kids in particular. So, for instance, I showed you that one where there was a thematic essay and then a medical report. You know, that's an example of if the child is more of a nonfiction lover, um, the child is more interested in science, he'll be assigned the medical report. You know, something that is in his interest, maybe that's what he wants to do with his life someday, something in the field of medicine. Um, I had another student, a reluctant writer, who we turned um, a college application slash internship letter into his assignment. So we worked on, it actually had to do with uh, fishing ecosystems and about um, the Atlantic bluefin or something to that effect. But we basically, like, we, we worked on making an emotionally toned letter that would really convince um, an employer or a college that he's interested because he struggles with the emotional tone. So we worked on that and he enjoyed that. Um, and now even this, what I showed you with the Google Doc, you know, the role of the ending in the fantasy genre, my student and I just came up with this. He cannot figure out what to write. He's not really into reading the books that we assign, but he loves fantasy. So instead of just summarizing all the fantasy books he's read, you know, we talked and I said, what really gets you about this book. When you, you have this book, what do you think? And he said, oh, the ending. I can't stand the ending. So we talked about it. We, what's the problem with the ending? We came to this, figured out that most fantasy novels have this open ending where you don't really know what kind of fosters imagination. And this series had this closure where the guy walked off a cliff or something. And so he's talking um, that that's what gets him. So we made a thesis statement about assessing the different styles of endings in fantasy genre and which one is more appropriate and why. So he's going to write a literary essay, but just not one that ever um, I would have thought of in the regular classroom. So, you know, this is what we do in high C. But, you know, I'm glad to share it with you, and I hope that covers English pretty well. And I think we'll turn it over now to Ms. Singer, who is going to talk about astronomy. Thank you, Ms. Thrush. Um, I hope you can all recognize the amount of work that, it, that goes in to creating some of these individualized courses. Uh, it's, it's, it's an opportunity that, that meant more and more of our students are, are, are really getting at the high school. Um, just to give you an idea, as I'm going to allow Ms. Singer to, to, to um, get started, but one of the things that we looked at this year is, okay, how can we encourage some of our students who aren't being successful in the traditional classrooms to in fact um, be successful in the high C classroom. And so we, we took that question and this is kind of what we've, we've come up with. You know, individualizing curriculum, making it so that it makes sense for the student. Just to give you an idea of, of some of our numbers, um, because of the asynchronous of the nature of, of the, um, the high C program that Ms. Thrush alluded to, I will tell you that at some point during our year we had over 300 of our 700 and and I think currently 70 students uh, enrolled in at least one high C course, and many of them were enrolled in multiple courses. Uh, what, what I can tell you also is that uh, we really do have a year-round school. Um, we have 284 students currently enrolled for this upcoming summer session. All of that is run through our high C program. Uh, so the same teachers that you're seeing presenting right now uh, are going to be working throughout the summer. Some students that are finishing from the year, but many students that are trying to receive new credits so that they can open slots in their schedule moving forward. Or some students who when they become seniors are going to want to take an additional elective class. And it also helps that many of our transfer students. Um, I have one this evening who's going to talk to you about uh, his opportunity that, that, that High C gave him in order to actually allow him to graduate. All right, so I'm going to now turn it over to uh, Miss Singer. Miss Singer, I gave her a, a pretty daunting task last year. I said, Miss Singer, I'm interested, and I think there was a, a cry from the students that we needed another science. 
Now, the advanced studies diploma requires that students earn four years of science credit. And so we have our chemistry, our physics, our biologies, and uh, we said, you know what, there are many schools in the area that are doing uh, astronomy. And so she said, so you want me to do astronomy? What do you have? And I said, I want you to build the course. So it, it started off as kind of a, a, a brainchild where we were going to visit other high schools. We visited universities. Astronomy is taught at the college level. And we wanted to turn it into a blended model, a hybrid class that allowed our students to be able to do labs online, um, but everything that was kind of built from within. Our goal moving forward is, is to actually turn that into a, a, a hybrid model that students can take in the classroom. But right now, we offer it strictly in the high C environment. So I'm going to allow her to kind of discuss uh, what, what our students are, are doing, and also with some of the other science classes as well. Hi, everyone. Thank you for allowing me to show you this course that I built from scratch. So you'll have to bear with me. I'm going to show you a lot of the technology that we use for astronomy. Um, one of the nice things about building your own course is I'm, I'm able to pull in a lot of applications that we use. It's a great that our students have the laptops to use. So they have unlimited amounts of opportunities where they can use certain things and I can incorporate and make the class more enriched. So I'm going to start out by showing you what the course would look like to a student, kind of how the um, units are outlined, and then from there I'll show you what certain applications we use, um, how our experiments happen. So at, like everyone knows, in a science course, the students have to have a lab component. And it's very important that whether they're doing an online lab or my students are going outside, either way they're getting that lab component and they're learning that content. So I'm going to show you two different ways that I've incorporated labs, um, whether it's outside, online, that sort of thing. So let's see if we can start with this. Oh, okay. Got to log out real quick. Sorry guys, bear with me, I just have to log it back into my class. Ooh. So like I said, our students, as I was able to build the class from scratch, we started out last year piloting the course. So I worked with four or five seniors. Um, they helped me kind of get an idea of what they're looking for in a course. I feel that it's very important that the students are expressing how they best learn, whether I think certain things are great because I'm a science teacher, but they're like, this isn't that great. It's boring. So I want to know what really pulls them into it. And they did a great job of showing me, you know, we want more interactive. We don't want the same thing over and over again. So that's why there's so many applications. Um, I've narrowed it down to, you know, the important five or six so that students aren't all over the web learning things. But, for example, this is what um, where each student goes through. In Unit 2, they're going to learn the major astronomers that influenced what we know as astronomy today. So, for instance, this is a timeline on Isaac Newton. The students expressed that they wanted to kind of see a you know, chronolo chronological way of what he did, how he did it, where he came from. So this is a great way for me to show students that you can click on this, watch a video in the timeline. And this is actually Isaac Newton talking about himself. So it really draws the students in and engages them. They can read about him and move on. So as you see, here's the date and what exactly they're talking about. So this is where Isaac Newton is from, his mathematician, mathematical mentor, how he went through his plague years, and so on and so forth. So I use that a lot of times when I want to talk about um, where a planet started and where it is now, where an astronomer started and what happened, certain things like that. Another great thing we use, and the reason I love Apple, is iBooks. I can create my own textbook chapters, which is great because in iBook, for example, you can have the students watch video clips or I can record myself talking and let the students listen to it as they're going through the chapter. So for example, this is a chapter on the sun. 
It's going to talk about the name. It's going to talk about its characteristics. Um, it's going to talk about com composition, structure, for example. On this page, for instance, right here, you can click on this little link. And this is actually a video that an astronomer talks about from Universe Today, and he talks about that specific characteristic that they had just read about. So it's great because it doesn't get too boring. The students aren't just reading 10 pages, but they're also engaging themselves and watching a video where they can hear me talk, vice versa. Let's see. Another great thing we show and we use is Edpuzzle. You can embed it right into Schoology um, using our applications. Schoology, you can add them on the, over here on our applications. Students can watch videos, but as they're watching them, I want to make sure that they're paying attention. Anybody can watch a video and play on your phone or stare at a, you know, at a picture on the wall. And I want to know that they're mastering the content that they're looking at. So a great way for me to do this, and I kind of skipped through to the part one of the questions, is as they're watching, I can ask the students a question throughout the video. So for instance, this is a 24 minute video. I wouldn't want to stare at a 24 minute video if I wasn't really enthralled in it, but I, if you want to learn about it and get the grade, you're going to answer a question about it, which should pop up. So the first question is, how would you define a black hole and how do you think they grow? And that's a great way for students to be creative and tell me what they think and where it came from, because that's what I want to know. Um, it's a little different from, you know, the students are not taking an SOL after this, so I can be more creative with getting the students to think out of their box and tell me how they're feeling or think or, you know, I know this, but why this? It, it, they use their imaginations, which is, which is great because it makes the course, basically. Students also use discussion boards. Ms. Thresh showed you guys how discussion boards work. Um, what I did this year is since we piloted the course last year, this discussion was also used last year with my five seniors. So I wanted to keep what the five seniors from last year had put in there. So our students were actually responding to the information from last year. But I also said that they are required to respond to two other classmates. I didn't want them to just put one comment in there and just forget about it. I want them to collaborate. They were also required to go back and respond to whoever responded to them, which is nice because it keeps the conversation going. So here, you can see a particular student said something, and then there were five replies back and forth between certain students, and they'd go back and forth on that particular topic. Let's see. Okay. As a science major, I think that it's very important that the students look at scholarly articles and they know about what kind of research is going on in the scientific world, not just what I'm putting in front of them. So what I like to use is I like to use, let's see, I can show you, a specific case study that is interacting with whatever they're learning right then. So this is the solar radiation modeling. Um, it's a, it is from ResearchGate. It's basically a scholarly source where the students read this particular case study, and it is written in scientific formatting. So they might not have to write something like this in the course, but maybe down the road they'll have to. They get used to what they're looking at. I want them to tell me, as you can see right here in this discussion, I want them to read the case study, and in a one to two page analysis, I want them to tell me what the problem is. And when you say what the problem is in science, is what is going on? How can it be changed? Are there sources of error? Do you think that what they're doing is right? How could, what do you think is going to come from this? How can it move beyond? That would be the problem in science. So I share a Google Doc with the students. It's a little bit like this. The students tell me what they're thinking. And they tell me if they added anything to it. And then next year, I hope to take this information and have the students share it with the next year and they're going to reflect back and say, well, that's a great idea, but if you add this on, maybe it'll work better. It's, I just want it to be ongoing and constantly interactive for the students. Another example, like I said, was doing the labs. I'm a big fan of labs, whether they're online gizmos um, that we started out using when we used Compass our first year, or sending the students outside. Um, either way, I want them to get that lab component. So here are two pictures. Well, let's start with this one. Uh, Maybe. Okay. Here's a particular picture. A couple of my students went outside. I wanted them to look at the soil, what really Earth is composed of based on its composition, its structure. I wanted them to tell me what specifically layer of Earth they were looking at. 
and then they were to report back to me and tell me what they found. So this is where we took our walking field trip right across the street to Trips Run Creek, um, right behind the pool. They went down to the creek, they did specific water testing, they tested for if there's any signs of um, alkaline, silicone that could have come from an ad atmosphere that is not where we are right now, certain stuff like that. And this is a particular student that worked inside, the, inside this building. He is working on testing different things. So on the left is where he started out to see how the chemical compositions in one planet would affect another. And then he let them sit in the middle. They sat for about a week. And this is where he tested them by mixing them up in the different cups. Um, another thing I said is my students, I want, them to be, I want them to use their imagination and I want them to be creative and I want them to tell me, you know, what do you think? What, what would you like to learn from this? How can you build upon it? So one of the final projects I have in the course is build your own solar system. And the students love this because I, I give them boundaries as far as I want to know the scientific facts about the planets and the moons, the stars, the galaxy, etc but they can put whatever, they, whatever scientific part they want to it, whether it's silicone or all oxygen, but I want to know why, and I want to know why they think it would work. So I'm going to show you a couple examples from students from this year. Part of the hybrid portion is some students wanted to draw. They didn't want to use online, so I was perfectly okay with them drawing their, app, their projects. This is one of the, I believe, 14 planets this particular student had. And this is a great example, and I wish I could switch it normally, but I'll have to show you. Okay. Here you can see the student showed me which layer of that particular planet was what, how many miles each layer was, the polar region, how much you would say in degrees, where if you were going to say at this particular degree, this is where this happens, the student had to say that as well, obviously the diameter and radius and he felt that drawing it was easier than putting it, say, on a Prezi or writing it to me. He felt like this expressed what he really could imagine himself. And he also included the satellites, how fast they go around this particular planet, and what they're looking for. This student did the same thing. This is just in color. He asked me if he could put, you know, I want to add mountains to it. I want to add creatures to the planet, whether they're humans or animals or things that are not on this planet. I want to make it my own. And that's the great thing about this is the students can add whatever they want. It's their planet as long as I know the composition, the structure, and it makes sense scientifically. I told them I wanted to know that. If it didn't make sense, it didn't count. It's not just a drawing project. So here you can see this person added volcanoes, these are the examples of life on this planet. Sorry, it's upside down. This is coral, ferns, etc. Another route the students took was I had an entire third block um, students. They were all seniors. They wanted to make a young money galaxy, which is musicians and rappers. Um, and like I said, bear with me, it's not just about the life of a rapper, so I'll show you how this works. All right, so obviously each planet is about that particular rapper or musician. They had to tell me this particular thing. They showed me the fit, how the degrees of it, the radius, etc. Another one, oh, it might be dark. Let me find it. a brighter one. Okay. This, they told me that it was 67% water, 33% land. Um, the atmosphere was 44% nitrogen, methane, oxygen. I wanted those facts. I wanted to make it similar. I wanted them to make it similar to what our atmosphere and our galaxy looks like. Um, but I wanted them to be creative, and I wanted them to tell me, you know, what they thought. And it's a great way to um, really engage with the seniors. They had a great time. They made this gigantic poster that I didn't bring in because it would take up half of the room. They drew every single one of them out. Um, and they had a great time, you know, working with each other to figure out, okay, well, that's not going to work. That's not going to float. That doesn't have gravity. That doesn't work. So it was great to see how they worked together. So this is a group project between four seniors. Okay. Um, these are just some examples that I use in astronomy. The courses... Let's 
The course, as you can see, has its subunits, reading, videos, um, ancient astronomy. I was able to really go all out with this course. I could add anything um, and be creative with it, and I think that it's constantly building. Um, as students tell me, you know, this was great, but what about this? I really want to know about this. I constantly add, I constantly delete stuff um, just to make it perfect, and it's, it is personalized to the students if they tell me, well, you know, I love this, but can I keep reading and do this and tell you what I read and write a paper? Sure, absolutely, keep going. Keep, you know, learning is everywhere. Keep going, tell me what you think. So this is so far what we have in astronomy, semester one and two, and like Mr. Hill said, hopefully one day it will be in the classroom full-time and not hybrid. Thank you, Ms. Singer. And uh, just as I said with Ms. Thrush, the, the amount of work that goes into building a course, I hope you guys can recognize. And, and really, the, the idea behind um, what I think Ms. Ms. Singer neglected to discuss was the fact that in our first year, when we started to actually consider offering such a course as astronomy, we said, all right, let's have the students help design and build. So we actually piloted it last year with three of our senior students who were working on it, and he said, okay, let's, let's try to gather some information. Uh, we took a field trip over to Falls Church High School, the planetarium. We started speaking with instructors. Uh, so it was almost like an internship for many of our students, but our students are now becoming course designers. I mean, this is when you talk about 21st century learning, this is what we're doing. They're working with the teachers. My teachers, yes, are the content specialists, but they're also facilitators in the classroom. Um, they're showing students what they're going to experience at the college level, uh, and, that's, and that's very important. So I think the whole idea of taking ownership of their learning is something we're trying to teach them, and they are absolutely 100% doing that. Uh, what, what I have in my hand here, right here, I have um, a total of 83 credits. So this is a number of seniors and ended up earning credits through our high C course this year. Many of them were through personal finance and economics. Uh, it's something where students are really, you know, they're, they're, they're recognizing that they want to take courses through high C, uh, the, the, the interactive setup, the way that they're able to really work at their own pace, but also go as fast as they would like. Um, it's, it's something that I think benefits our students. Students are, in fact, deciding how they want to work. Um, our teachers are motivating them when needed. Uh, and, and I think it's something that is really kind of a new style of learning for many of our students. So, so now I'm going to introduce you to some of our students. I'm going to let them share their story with you. Uh, kind of what High C has done for them, how it has helped them be successful inside and really outside the classroom. So the, the, the first young lady I'm going to introduce to you uh, is a freshman. Her name is Taika Van Hein Wallace. She, um, I actually had the pleasure of meeting her last year in eighth grade, and we, we had a conversation. She was uh, considering enrolling in a math course, and in, in the brief conversation I had with her, I could tell she was yearning for a challenge. Uh, and, you know, I said, what better way than to put her in, let's say, maybe one high C class her freshman year. So we put her in a history class, and that kind of took off. So I'm going to let her come up. Uh, no, actually, you're going you're to talk up there, yes. Yeah. So I'm going to let her kind of describe her experience with, with high C and uh, what it's done for her. Thank you. Mr. Hill says I was yearning for a challenge, not really. I wanted to pass algebra. <laughs> So that's what I did the summer of my eighth grade year. Then he put me in a history course for my ninth grade year, and I was there during the summer, and I said, Mr. Hills, please put me in a course. I'm bored. So he put me in, in, the, in World Civ II, the normal or the what ninth graders usually take. I finished that by the end of the first day of winter break. Cool. I was done. I waited about a month. I said, Mr. Hills, I'm bored. He said, okay. Put me in economics, personal finance. Finish that in six weeks. And I said, okay, I'm bored again. I haven't done high C in four days. I know I can be doing something. I am now 90% done with earth science class. So I've been under th all three of the high C teachers in the room. So, yay. And it's really nice. I like I like the compass setup. It's they have different teachers each each video, and they take it's about ten minutes. And they take a break and they say, okay, 
go breathe and you do that and then you go to the next video then you take a quiz and it's really nice because I can take I can go at my own pace which happens to be really really fast I take notes I'm not really I'm not confused and if I am I can say hey Miss Singer what's a black hole hey Miss Thrush who won the Crusades or something of that nature and it's a very nice setup because each teacher it's a different person each time and a lot of times with history they would take on a character so I had one woman pretend she was from Transylvania during when I was learning about Russia and the history teachers they dress up as paleontol not history earth science teachers they dress up as paleontologists or stargazers it's I like it Ben Th thank you Taika um, what what take <laughs> I'm going to allow the board to, to ask uh, the students questions r right after, but what Taika was alluding to, uh, she talked about the program Compass. So when we first started in this endeavor about four or five years ago, uh, we decided that we we're going to go with um, Compass, -y, or Compass Odyssey Learning. It's a program that we use that basically aligns all of the content uh, to the Virginia standards of learning. And so we started with that, and that was really our baseline that we used, but we recognized it wasn't as interactive as it could have been. So some of our courses are in the process of transitioning over to Schoology. As you saw as was presented by our teachers. Um, some of our history courses we still use a combination of, of Compass, which is what Taika discussed, and the video format that seems to really work for her. So the style and the way that the, the, the course is presented is something that has been quite a success for Taika. She's gotten through several of her courses, she's very motivated, um, but what this also means for her is going forward, you know, next year a student like Taika, she would be a sophomore and she would have to be required to take a total of seven courses. Okay, she would not have have the opportunity to take something like uh, a class over at the Arlington Career Center as a sophomore. But now because she's finished her three classes, three additional classes, uh, she is going to be able to enroll hopefully in a culinary arts class at ACC next year. She may do it, she may not. We're talking about a possible internship on, in, in the building. But we'll, we'll oh wait, I'm not later. done. <laughs> and most of the seniors, I'm in block six which is at the end of the end of the day. Mo there's a majority of seniors in that class. All of the Miss Williamson, who is the economics teacher, she's saying, okay, this is your pacing guide. Why aren't you done? Why aren't you up to this? Because I'm finished with economics, when I'm a senior, I can look around and say, ha, I'm done. <laughs> and I got that done three years earlier. It's very helpful. Absolutely. So, and and it's really going to give her several opportunities uh, that she can she can use throughout throughout her her high school career. So we're very excited that she's part of the program and will continue to take courses. Uh, the the next student I'm going to introduce you to is is Ben Salick. Uh, ben has a very interesting story, and I don't want to steal his thunder, but let me just go ahead and tell you. I got a an email about two years ago uh, from from Ben's mom, and Ben's mom uh, Ben had been going to I guess you were over at MEH at the time. Uh, they had recognized that their family family was taking uh, a position over in France. Uh, he was very concerned because at the school that Ben was going to, they did not have the opportunity for him to enroll in a math or an English class. So he knew that he was going to be returning to us his 10th grade year, and then he really wouldn't be with his age appropriate peers. So he was afraid that, okay, my 10th grade year, I'm going to be in, you know, 10th grade history, um, 10th grade electives, but I'm going to be in an English 9 and a math 9 course. Uh, I don't know if I want to do that. Uh, so it it was a challenge for us, but we said, why don't we come up with a plan? So I'm going to let uh, Ben talk a little bit about his experience with the high C program and how it helped him build confidence. So as Mr. Hill said, last year I took um, high C geometry and high C English 9. Um, I really enjoyed them. Great flexibility, especially living overseas. I could span out the course how I wanted to over the years. So it gave me an opportunity if I worked like really hard two weeks, then I could take a break over a vacation. I could really space it out how I wanted to. Um, I believe when I took English, they were still on Compass. Um, seems like they've transitioned to school G now. Um, still, I really enjoyed it. Um, same with math. Math was also, I think, on Compass as well. Um, great course, great organization. The videos were very informative. They really went through all the points in the way what, what you're supposed to know for each um, like SOL standard. Um, also, I wasn't really good at math before I took high C math. Um, before that, I was getting all right grades in math, especially in Algebra 1 and um, the year before, which I think is like math seven. So um, definitely over that year, I definitely improved in math. Now I'm in algebra two, um, doing really well in algebra two. Great year for me in math. Um, same with English as well. Um, 
wasn't really good at grammar before I went into high C English. Uh, after that, definitely knew all the points of grammar, the independent clauses, the dependent clauses. Still helping me today in English 10, doing a theater project, and definitely need to know where the commas go. So it's definitely worthwhile for me. Thank you, Ben. And, and I really asked Ben to be here. He, we were having a conversation. He's actually one of, one of my tennis players as well. And so we get an opportunity to, to chat often. And he told me about how, you know, High C really kind of built his confidence. He, he felt kind of uh, almost in, inadequate in a way when it came to math and English. And when I heard that story, I said, you, you got to tell. You got you to speak about it. And so thank you for being here tonight. Uh, the, the last student I have here is uh, uh, senior Nick Slutcher. Nick has a very, very unique story. Uh, Nick came to us. I want to say around March-ish, uh, and he was in, in need of graduating. Um, he definitely wasn't sure if he was going to be able to graduate, and so I'm going to let him talk a little bit about his experience taking three high C classes. I should probably turn that on. Um, ladies and gentlemen, five months ago I was knee-deep in the IB program. I was going through all the heightened anxiety of just getting out of midterms or just getting prepared for midterms. And I was halfway across the world in a little country off the coast of the Caspian Sea called Azerbaijan. Today, I'm not gonna talk as much about that. I'd like to introduce instead a number, specifically the number three. Three has been very important to me. It was three days after my midterm exams that I got medically evacuated from Azerbaijan and brought back to Falls Church. Uh, after being discharged from the hospital, I spent three weeks accepting the fact that I would have to take a GED test instead of getting my full IB diploma that I had spent two years preparing for. Um, I was told that there was no way to enroll me as a second semester senior in a high school anywhere in the area, uh, the District of Columbia, Maryland, or Virginia. Um, I was told that I'd have to take the GED, GED test, and little did I know, FCCPS was working with my parents to enroll me in George Mason High School in the High C program. Uh, the program truly was a godsend. I'll always be grateful for the for everyone's diligent work getting me through the three classes that I had to take in just under three months. The flexible schedule, the pace, and the efficiency were all important, but the schedule was the most engaging aspect of the high C program. It allowed me to participate in both personally and academically uh, engaging and growing, if that's a word, um, growing uh, activities. I tried out for the JV show at George Mason. I worked towards mastering my base skills. I am holding down a part-time job at this point. I applied and got into my choice college. Um, and I've just personally grown from out, grown past my medical problems at this point. On, on top of the ongoing treatment I receive weekly, I've had to take English, U.S. government, and U.S. history to pass with everyone else in my high school class, the class of 2016. Due, due to the ability to take all of my classes at school and at home while still having contact with Ms. Thrush, bless her heart. <laughs> um, yeah, maybe a little bit too much contact taking all those quizzes at home. Um, <laughs> um, I was able to pursue all those enriching activities and improve my skills as well as contribute to the school itself. Um, the three classes I took during the semester were all in the high C program and as no in-class, well class, I don't know how better to say that, um, no class has the intensity that I needed to be able to graduate, take three years or one year, three classes w in the time allotted. Being in a class of fellow high C students, um, they welcomed me in. I remember sit standing in the high C classroom with the bean bags and the comfy chairs, almost as comfy as these chairs. Um, I remember looking at everyone and thinking, oh my gosh, I don't know how to be in an American high school. I've been overseas forever. 
and everyone welcomed me in. They showed me how to use Schoology and Compass, depending on what class I was taking. And they showed me their friends, who in turn showed me their friends, and I learned that American high schools aren't all the breakfast club. Um, <laughs> um, between helpful teachers, engaging videos using many different learning types, and an adjustable schedule, the HiC program allowed me to graduate with a life-changing high school diploma with a civic stamp on it, instead of the disappointing GED that I would have had to accept without Falls Church. And guess how many months it took me to complete the program? That's right, two and a half. Let, I like to round up. <laughs> That's, that's a great story, Nick. Thank you so much for, for sharing. And it just kind of speaks to how high C is not meant for one particular student. It's meant for all. Uh, that, that's been our goal from and our motto from the start. Uh, we're, we're constantly excited about uh, students who want to accelerate their academic path, students who need remediation, or students who want a differentiated approach. It, we, we meet all the needs of, of every type of learner, and, and that's great. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and let uh, one of our parents uh, come up to the podium and speak a little bit about her experience with the high C program. So, Ms. Capozzi, if you would join us. Sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Hill. Thank you, everybody, for allowing me to come and join the session. Um, so going to back to school night and seeing the wonderful comfy couches and chairs and bean bags and thought, wow, this is great, but hmm, how's this class gonna run? So I was, I had heard about high C, but I didn't really know a lot about it. So hearing some things from Mrs. Thrush, because my daughter was in her English class, um, you know, very excited about it, but still a little skeptical. But as the year went on, and my daughter had a wonderful experience, um, I became very impressed with the program. Uh, it was a challenging curriculum. Took her from where she needed to, uh, where she needed to start, and took her onward and beyond. I feel, I feel like she's grown so confident over the year in herself. Um, it was a very well organized program. Uh, very structured, but gave that flexibility as to how to complete the lessons and, um, you know, in a timely manner or needed that level of flexibility, it gave that flexibility. Uh, like a lot of you had said this evening, I uh, met a lot of uh, learning styles uh, within the program, and that is uh, truly impressive. Uh, to meet different modalities for the kids. Um, the teachers, phenomenal, uh, very knowledgeable in, set in setting up this program. The timely feedback is extremely important um, as you're learning and that's where you make mistakes and you're getting that immediate feedback uh, that's where the most growth happens and so that was phenomenal catering to the uh, individual needs um, and the accessibility to the teachers um, through Schoology and in the classroom uh, was was very beneficial to her um, and again a very relaxed at learning atmosphere which uh, you know made it a low stress uh, extremely risk-taking environment uh, which excels that learning um, and it just really prepped her for uh, going onward next year so she's enrolling in a dual enrollment class um, for uh, English writing uh, which is great because that was not her forte and again <laughs> the whole grammar piece and uh, Mrs. Thrush being on her with that she's learned um, a lot and very confident to jump into that so I'm extremely impressed with the program and it's uh, it's done wonderful things and uh, provided a lot of great experiences thanks All right, thank you, Ms. Capozzi, I appreciate that. All right, so we're gonna give the opportunity for the board to go ahead and, and ask any questions they would like of our, our teachers or, or students. I might actually want to answer Tyga's question. The, the black hole won the Crusades. And we all passed our SOLs, just in case anyone was wondering. Yeah, somehow. The grades haven't come in for mine yet. Don't count on that. Yeah. <laughs> somehow, I don't think any of us are worried. Um, first, thank you for coming out, and especially you three, since I, I can't imagine not having 100,000 things that are more enjoyable to do than 
be here with us, so thank you. Especially because my son goes into ninth grade last year, so I really need to start to understand this in a way that I just don't right now. Um, my main question is Schoology. You know, and there was talk about Compass, and obviously I have no idea what that is. Are you using Schoology for this because we have it and you figured out how to make it work, or is there something about Schoology that actually works really, really well with high C and how you do it? Because it, it almost seemed like they were made to work together the way you two were going through everything. So I'm curious, did you just make the best out of what you had, or do these, are these meant to go together? No, I mean, I, I think they are meant to go together. I think Schoology as a learning management system is, I think, one of the prime ones that is for uh, course creation, that you can create it a purely online class with hybrid component, but, you know, with the mastery settings, with the completion controls, where you could track the student progress, the discussion boards, I mean, Schoology has everything we need, really, to create a course that's, you know, truly aligned to the standards, aligned to MYP, should we choose so, um, and it works perfectly, because it allows us to take, we can take videos from Compass, we can import Compass videos when necessary, um, not all of them, but the ones that fit our needs, and then in the units, like for some novels, Compass doesn't have them, for, for those units, I can take online content, my own content, everything, I pull from everywhere, so it's really, a way to get away where Compass was just their videos and their questions. And here I can use their videos when I want to, but a lot of it is my own um, content and what I find online and what I think is important. So I can set it up as, I think, truly a, a really great learning experience, totally tied to standards and trackable. So it's great. Yeah, I, Cindy basically said everything I would say. I think, too, um, as far as like astronomy and science courses, and I know Cindy pulls a lot of outside applications, Schoology does a, Schoology does a great job of like, having those extensions to those applications. So you can use Schoology as your main platform, but you can navigate to Educanon, or you can navigate to Blue Big Blue Button, which is a video conferencing. So if our students are in France and we need to talk to them on, say, what, you know, Skype or something, it incorporates all those things. And I've used Blackboard and I've used other management systems, and I just feel like this is the easiest. We love Blackboard. Or, uh, we love Schoology, and we're super excited to move all of all of our Compass content to it. It's more personalized, mm -hmm. and it makes our lives a little easier too. No, see, no one else. Okay. Um, now, obviously, you got a lot of input from kids. Sorry, students in building your new course. Mm -hmm. For you three, what could be different? I mean, you've gone through and you've, you've obviously seen a lot. Uh, things can always improve. I mean, what, what would it be? And, and you're allowed to be happy with, with what we've got, but I mean, what it comes down to is it seems like something like this is, the, the beauty of it is it is so changeable on really short notice for whatever a kid needs that if, if it gets static, it almost seems like something's wrong. The economics format is horrible. So Compass is they... No, honestly, how do you feel? <laughs> <laughs> I was waiting for you to finish. So the Compass, they bought it. The teachers went out and said, oh my gosh, this looks interesting. Cool, let's pay money for it. The, I'm not sure how they... Well, I know the, how they obtained it, but who regulates it? The state of Virginia regulates it. I don't know who made it. And this is the state of Virginia saying, oh, our kids need to take this to graduate. Here is a formatting learning platform for that and it is awful with compass there's videos there's odyssey writers there's your reading things there's all different types of whoops all different types of mid platforms to learn with the economics platform there's there's just purely reading and there was 160 modules and there was three videos each of them under two minutes and they had near nothing to do with the content it was just this is how you apply it but that's not the teacher's fault or the school's fault that's the state's fault no one can really control that in this room and at the end of it it says Virginia SOL da, 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 da. so we can say oh thank you whoever created this it's not I mean granted I learned economics and I was really interested in it but at one point I was just staring at a screen bored out of my mind like Adam Smith can only be so interesting can I add something? Yeah. Um, as far as personal finance and economics goes, um, this year Ms. Williamson took over. She is our math teacher. Um, she's currently, hopefully, going on maternity leave today. Tonight would be great. Yesterday. Um, yeah. Her due date was yesterday. That's why I say that. Um, 
next year, I know that we're adding in, the teacher's going to be adding in projects. Um, it was a SCORM that, was gotten, uh, that had been obtained from the state of Virginia, and that entire SCORM was put into Schoology at the very beginning of the hybrid program. So like we've said, we're constantly changing our courses. This summer, we're really working to put the rest of the classes from Compass to Schoology, and that's one of those courses that we're going to go through, and we're going to change, and we're going to enrich, add, delete, certain things like that. I mean, and I can add, it is a very time-consuming process. I'll be taking over economics starting this summer and for next year, um, and I know now how to build a course in Schoology. When you saw the three formats, by topic, by week, and by lesson, that's over the course of the last year and a half. Every time there's a new semester, I basically make a new course, and I renew it. It is a constant process. Um, the one that's by less than the ninth grade, I truly believe it has everything that I have learned about Schoology. It's good. Um, if you put economics in that same format, it will be good. Um, there's, yeah, the ninth grade is, I'm very confident that that is exactly what MYP wants and it is standards based and I would put that up against any course that could be offered anywhere, it's, it's good. So that's our goal for this summer is to have all of our courses in Schoology starting September 6th, at the 16th, 17th year. Personal finance will be one of them too. Your comment on the fluidity of a high C program, it, it sparks a study that I did back in my other school in Azerbaijan where uh, formats such as Schoology and Compass work for different reasons at different points in time. As generations move on from just the normal auditory, olfact not olfactory, smelling, um, <laughs> the hearing, listening, and apparently smelling versions of education, different hybrid forms of learning will become more popular. Back in, I would say, my dad's time, uh, they learned to, they learned by uh, being told information and writing it down and learning it at home on their own, and that was how it was done, and that was the most popular of its time. Now, engaging the student is the popular trend. In the future, it might be some other olfactory form of learning. And so as learning changes, so will the high c program. And so will all of our opinions on the high c program as well. And if I just may add one thing, um, and I appreciate Ms. Singer describing our, our personal finance and economics program, which, you know, percentage-wise, based on summer enrollment, you're probably looking at about 40% uh, of students enrolled taking a course like that. Uh, Volume-wise, as I stated, it, it is where most of our students are taking the, the hybrid uh, courses. Uh, one of the things that, that Taika alluded to, she makes several excellent points. When you have a total of 19 classes that you're offering, um, we're, we're going step-by-step step to make sure that we're engaging the students, making it more interactive. Uh, I think the personal finance econ class has, has made steps in the right direction. I think two, three years ago, um, Tyga's description might have been even a little bit worse. I'm not sure how. But um, what, what I can tell you is, you know, the, the idea behind what Ms. Singer alluded to is absolutely what, what we're planning to do. Uh, it's, it's something where we want it to be a way for students to understand the material uh, by doing and not by just sitting and reading PDF files and, and going ahead and, and answering you know questions on quizzes so I think we're, we're in a very good place moving forward uh, and, and looking forward to all the possibilities and I think Tyke you just made yourself a new project for uh, this summer so it's gonna be fun so so with respect to the evolution of high C and also you all have taken between the, among the three of you almost a dozen so you've, you've had an experience of taking several courses. Compare and contrast the courses you've taken. Describe the differences and the relative strengths and weaknesses. No, but seriously, what, what, what made some courses a little better than others trying to adjust for content? Was there, is there some pattern or secret that you managed to detect in, in what made for a, a relatively better course? I can start or I can end as well. <laughs> um, but seriously, I took U.S. government, U.S. history, and half a credit of English. I personally prefer U.S. government and history to English, no offense. Um, but 
the, what am I saying? You do both of those, total offense. Um, uh, the, the class setting for history is a lot more presentable in an online format, uh, meaning that the, the core of history is you learn the dates, you learn about the events, and you learn how they contribute to what we know at this point. And that is very presentable in a high C program to where you can watch a video and you can read a book and you can understand the events, you can uh, mold those over in your head and understand them a lot better than, say, in English when more Socratic seminars are beneficial as opposed to just writing an essay and reading a book and writing an essay. So I, I much prefer the factual-based classes in a high C environment to more Socratic or, um, I guess, interactive classes. So definitely I agree. Um, certainly with English and math, I think that those are m better like taught with um, more an interactive component. Um, when I did English, it was I think it was all on Compass when I did it. So um, there were some like essays and stuff and grammar that was out of Compass, but um, I feel that with Compass back when they were using Compass in the English courses, um, just the videos, their videos, their quizzes, um, kind of their way of doing it, um, without like being supplemented with outside projects and um, kind of outside like stuff on Schoology, outside projects, made the course a bit um, very sequential and without um, diversity it was like the same intros, the same video, the same guy, and there were like a skits in a couple of them that were kind of strain strange. <laughs> like, um, like every episode they had like, they're kind of an episode format. Um, they had like these people who'd like discuss the topics and kind of like a small group discussion thing. But definitely, I think you did a great job incorporating outside projects like the essays and um, the videos, some of the video, I don't remember, the Educan and stuff. There was some of that in that course as well. So definitely, Compass on its own is not great, but added with other courses, uh, with like other videos and other projects, it, it worked well. Same as math. Um, math, I think, is better when it's explained like in videos. Compass did a all right job doing the videos, but um, it looks like all the courses now in schools you look a lot more interactive and diverse with more flexibility than on Compass. In one respect, I do prefer Compass. The man to the man who taught me had really nice ties. <laughs> I'm going to disagree with Ben as well, but he took very different courses. English and math are both thought-provoking where you have to think about the sector of an arc or why did this guy die or something. Very, It's not factual-based, and I took history and earth science on Compass, which are both very factual-based. Two plus two will always equal four. And I... I really liked it because it was very colorful and there were all different types of teachers. They had all different types of backgrounds and they would say, okay, well, I'm an ancient Russian Bolshevich. They're not ancient, but whatever. Um, I'm a paleontologist who just digged up, dug, dug up some rocks and there are five layers. Can you identify every layer on this and which is the oldest, which is the youngest? So I like Compass in that respect, but definitely taking math, I think, would be hard, but I haven't done that, so I can't comment on that. Thank you. And then I guess I just kind of follow up that are, are there lessons that, I mean, I, I remember seeing a government class several years ago, and it, it does sound as if things have, have evolved significantly. Are there things that high C's lessons about uh, digital curriculum, are, are, are you learning things that have application elsewhere within George Mason and, and elsewhere within the division? Yeah, sorry. For do you mean are we sharing what we do in high C with the rest of the division? Or? Right, and, and and what exactly are you learning? What what are some of the lessons that are, you know, with respect to integrating um, all kinds of aspects of of, of the hybrid learning? Um, 
you know, if, if you've got devices in the classroom, are there lessons that, that you've learned that, that have broader application? I mean, I'm, right now, I would say um, with grades 9 and 10, with the MYP rollout that we have right now, um, that's where we see the most teaming. Um, there is a group on Schoology called the English uh, Department homepage, and I've created um, something called Schoology Questions and Resource Bank. So basically, there's a 9, 10, 11, 12 group for teachers of each grade level to come together and share resources. Um, we do meet as teams, and we discuss common assessments and common, um, you know, common objectives for the different units. I know as a high C teacher, I mean, I try to take a lead in my department and share things I found online that are helpful to English, like curricula, like Learn Actively. Um, there's a poetry site I forget the name of, but you can have group annotation of poetry. You know, I, I went to the Google Summit and I shared a spreadsheet of resources with the department. So I think it's a, it's a learning process. There's some teachers upstairs that use tech more than others. Um, we have to use it all the time. So we're kind of pigeonholed into the tech way, but that makes us learn a lot about it. Um, and when when the students were talking, especially um, like you know Ben, Ben took you know English 1.0. You know English is already now at English 3.0 pretty much. It's it's evolved so much since he's taken it, and it's going to keep getting better. Um, you know, as far as some Socratic discussions they can have upstairs, yeah, they can. Um, we can't. What I would say is we have more one-on-one. -on -one. So if a student is struggling, if a student wants to, to really get to know something, I mean, I have a student right now who I spend you know, half of every class with when he's there talking about Macbeth one-on-one, -on -one, and I don't think he's the kind of kid who would ever talk about Macbeth in a classroom. So it works for some kids, and those are kids who, in the traditional classroom, they could sit there and a wonderful discussion could be going on around them, and they could come out at the end of the year hardly being any different because they didn't really participate. So. You know, there, it's high seas a place for some kids, and what matters is we meet the needs of, of those kids. Mm -hmm. And I think incorporating the high sea program at George Mason, too, our, when we talk about teachers upstairs, I've seen some people look around. The hybrid classroom is downstairs near the art room, so we're not, like, in a basement in a dungeon. It's just we talk about, like, walking up the stairs, so the traditional upstairs classroom, so that's what we mean by upstairs. We're not in a totally different area. Um, the classrooms upstairs, they do a great job of meeting those students' needs, and I think one of the reasons we the hybrid program is so necessary is to meet the needs to help the school meet the needs of all students. Like she said, she is a student who doesn't like talking, might not like talking in a classroom or might be shy and he doesn't want to talk about, you know, how he feels or what he's thinking. I have students like that too. They don't want to be creative. They don't, you know, want to keep going and enrich themselves. So it's a great way for me to pull them aside and go, okay, what are you thinking? Tell me what you think. What do you, could you expand on that? And it's a working one-on-one, -on -one, we really get to know our students really well, whether it's on, you know, just as a student teacher level, knowing their strengths and weaknesses in the classroom or knowing, okay, well, you know, at home, they really like to learn this way. So instead of all reading and all videos, they want to have more discussions and they want to write more. It's a great way for us to get to know our students. And um, it really is personalized. Um, that was, that's a big word that we love and we definitely use. Um, like Cindy said, we go to our department meetings. Um, so when the science department has their um, bi biweekly meetings, I go to those. We also have the same planning as the other teachers in that particular department. So it's a great way for us to collaborate with them. Um, we work a lot with Mr. Steve Knight. Um, he's like our saving grace. Um, when we go to the professional development, when we talk about tech, He'll show other teachers what we do if we haven't already shown them. And he'll also show us how to incorporate more digital citizenship for our students. Um, we can do a great way of adding the classes, but to protect that and you have our students become digital citizens is great. So I feel like we're incorporating a lot from a lot of different places. And we're also giving a lot back, if that makes sense. It makes sense in my head. But. Sorry, the, the two of you said something was sort of, you know, niggling in the back of my head about, you know, meeting needs of all students. It seems like something that is so adaptable would particularly be great for kids who are either ESOL students or kids with learning disabilities of, of one sort or another. Mm -hmm. um, so if you could just speak to, you know, how this, how this helps, how it works, um, what it does. 
first? I can start. Um, I do have students in both of those particular areas. Some are ESOL students who work, they have a particular person who is native in whatever language they are that helps with the course. Um, also, getting them involved personally, not just watching the computer screen is great, which is definitely that hybrid portion. I spend a lot of time having the conversations or they, you know, making them feel comfortable to go, okay, this is, I understand what half of this is, but can you describe it to me? Can you show it to me? Can you draw it on the board? Or, you know, give me an idea of what I'm looking at. That's a lot of what I do personally with ESOL students, with students with special needs. Um, like I said, getting to know our students, that's the biggest thing with knowing their strengths and weaknesses and knowing, you know, they're, this is not their strong point, and that's okay. But knowing how to build that weak point with all their strong aspects. So if one student is not good at the factual base, or I particularly have one student who came to the hybrid classroom, I would say a month or two ago, he needs personal finance and earth, earth science. He was not excelling in the earth science classroom in a traditional setting. He looked at me and he goes, I'm just not interested in earth science. I don't like what it says. You know, I just, I'm not, I can't stay engaged. And I said, okay. For the first class period, we talked about what he is and what he does like and why, it, you know, those, his needs aren't being met. And he goes, well, I really want to join the military. And I really like knowing certain things about this. And I said, okay, well, give me a day or two. We'll start your course and keep going. So basically, in our MAPS unit of our earth science class, I related everything to wars and military tactics. He got an A, he got an F in the traditional classroom. He loves it and he could recite it now to you right now. Um, so I think a big part of what we do for this special, you know, this learning needs of students, whether it's a strength or a weakness or ESOL, it's getting to know those students and knowing that they have strengths somewhere, even if a lot of people are like, that's their weak subject. You have to build their weak subjects and weak, or weak strengths by their strong ones because they're able to do it one way or the other. Um, as far as that question, I think the high C setup, um, the room as we have it in the individual instruction, uh, offers a level of comfort to the types of kids that you talked about, um, ESOL kids who might feel uncomfortable speaking up in class due to language barriers, um, kids with verified disabilities who, you know, struggle with emotional tone or group discussion or group work, but, and that's true, like we definitely are a comfortable place for them and we will modify and change the course to meet their needs, but, but honestly when I think about high C, all the kids are special. You know, everybody has their own abilities and everybody has their own disabilities and ways that they can grow. And the thing is, in a classroom of 30 kids, you don't really know every kid. I mean, in high C, because we spend more time assessing and less time teaching just face-to-face -to, -face to the class, I mean, we're constantly assessing our kids and find out what are their own particular ways that they need to improve so that their abilities improve no matter who you are. I mean, I don't see any kids as different or disabled. I see them all as people in need of moving up. So we take them where they are and we move them to where they need to be. Um, and we will do whatever it takes to get them there. And as I said, you don't get out until you finish. You don't just take the zero. You don't just not write the paper and whatever, I'll get a D and I'll still pass. Nope, you won't pass. You're, okay, you're you'll finish. be here when the summer with me. So that's yeah. as much that's as much of a threat as it sounds. <laughs> One-on-one -on -one writing help. <laughs> yep. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next up is the safety and security update and uh, we might as well just go back up to the dais and we can get the update from Sevy there. Thank you very much. Thank you for coming. All that stuff. All that stuff.
All right, uh, next on our agenda is the safety and security update. Welcome, Mr. Padilla. Thanks. Should I give him just some? No worries, minutes? take your time. Oh, there we go. Okay. All right, so the, the agenda is a little off. It says just safety and security, but this was actually I'm over facilities and security and safety and security, so I'm giving sort of both. So I'm going to start with the facilities. We'll, we'll ask, then we can ask some questions if you have any, and then we'll go into safety and security ones. So it's a little long. After has a great presentation, mine's a little depressing and and uh, boring, but compared to theirs. But anyway, here we go. Okay, um, thank you. I'm Sevi Padilla, the director of facilities and uh, security for the district. Um, so I'll just, I'm, we're talking about facilities first. So basically. More with less. We've been we've we've heard that phrase a million times. Um, the facilities department is constantly being asked to do that, um, but we, we we sort of just need to acknowledge that less is never more. The math is pretty clear on that, right? Um, since 2009, the facilities department has hired no additional staff, custodial or maintenance. But we've actually lost staff since the Great Recession um, just due to attrition. Uh, we currently only have six full-time maintenance staff to cover everything in the district. And that's been the same consistently, even with the additional 40,000 square feet we've added um, over the, since with all the construction. We've added approximately 567 students since 2009. Um, still, the same staff. Um, additionally, we've, we've been defunded by about $40,000 a year uh, for various things from the city. Uh, most of it's been related to grass cutting, the, the rain garden maintenance, the leaf removal in the fall, uh, tree trimming, all these, all these were shared services at one point, no longer, they are no longer. These are all in addition to all the cuts that the city council and school board made this, for this upcoming year. So we're absorbing even more uh, moving, moving forward. Um, and I'll even make a note with the tree trimming, the city actually employs an urban forestry team that, that manages all the city sites, but they don't do it for us. That was a shared service and they defunded that at some point. Uh, a few years ago, so that's just one more thing that we're not we're not really co collaborating together that I think we could somehow move for moving forward. Um, the next few slides are just sort of an overview of all of our sites. Um, J George Mason, we have two hundred approximately two hundred thousand square feet originally constructed in nineteen fifty four. Uh, the most recent renovations were in the ninety three ninety four school year. Uh, it currently has six modular classrooms that were installed in two thousand three. Um, major infrastructure investment is needed on that site, as we all know. Mary Ellen Henderson, built in 2005, approximately 130,000 square feet. Uh, no major infrastructure needs at this, at this time in that building. Uh, TJ, about 100,000 square feet now uh, with a new addition. Um, originally constructed in the 1950s, um, most recent addition was done in 2013. And currently six modular classroom trailers which were installed in 2014. Um, this summer, we have a new HVAC system going in the old section of the building, the part that was not touched during the 2013 renovation addition. Mount Daniel Elementary, uh, we're sitting at about 46,000 square feet over there right now. Originally constructed in 1952. Uh, most recent additions were kindergarten wing in 2005. And we have four modular classrooms there. And as we all know, major infrastructure, infrastructure need is, is, is needed, our infrastructure investment is needed in that building. And we are currently waiting um, from the Fairfax County Planning Commission on, on where that project is going. Uh, Jesse Thackeray Preschool is our newest facility. We have, it's approximately 10,000 square feet. Um, originally constructed in the 1950s and the most recent uh, renovation and addition was completed in 2015. And no major infrastructure needs are, are infrastructure are needs there. So I'm just gonna start with George Mason. We're in a dire situation with George Mason if you haven't been there in a while. It may look good from the outside. You walk in the building, the paint's okay, the floors are okay. Um, sometimes it's comfortable temperature-wise, sometimes it's not. Um, but it's in really bad shape behind the scenes. The roofing, the HVAC, all the life safety systems, which are the fire alarms, the sprinklers, 
burglary alarms, the intercoms, our elevators. Everything is very old and is requiring lots and lots of maintenance if and when it, it, it's working and not down. Um, it's literally crumbling between, beneath our feet. And if you were there, if you were there over spring break, if you happen, if you were a staff member, somebody walked by, or all the students knew after the fact. Um, when we replaced all that flooring, that was an emergency repair because they were the tile, the floor tiles were literally coming up all over the building. Um, I, we we're anticipating more of that moving forward because we only did small sections, and all that tile was installed in the '93, '94 renovation. So it's theoretically, you would think the rest of it's going to fail at some point in the future, in the near future as well. Discussing the HVAC system, um, everything was installed in that building with the exception of a few things um, in the 93-94 renovation. So everything's 23 years old right now. Um, the average life ex expectancy is about 15 to 20 years for most pieces of equipment. Um, at the A, B, and C wing boilers, uh, one is from 1951, one is from 1971. Uh, one, the, the 1971 boiler is the actual, the one that failed during the winter this month where we had students sitting in classrooms with no heat or minimal heat um, because we did have one boiler running but it was, trying, it was trying to keep up on a really cold day. Um, thankfully it was just barely warm enough so we didn't have to cancel classes but we were, we were right at that breaking point. Um, and that's a common occurrence. Uh, the D, E, and F wing has two steam boilers from 93. They're in relatively good shape. If you've been to a, a, a play or a concert or anything in auditorium recently, you've probably noticed it's pre usually pretty warm in there. One of the three air conditioning units is completely failed. It's rusted out. There's no way to repair it. Um, we're, we're working, trying to get a, a, a price on replacing that one. But it, it's, it's going to be a fifty to $100,000 cost for one unit. And there's three in there. All three were installed at the same time. They're all sitting in the exact same place. So theoretically, the other two probably could fail at any point in time as well. And they're constantly going down. Um, so cooling capacity in that, in that auditorium is sitting around 60% right now. And if we have a really hot day, we're not going to be able to cool it down. Um, the classroom units do constantly fail. If they're not failing, you saw, you may have seen some tweets from the lasso or something recently where there was water pouring out of one of the light fixtures in the girls' locker room hallway. That's condensate lines that are constantly clogging up all over the building. Um, these are just due to age. There's not much we can do. It's, it's a huge building, a lot of equipment um, in the ceilings, on the roof, outside, and it all needs to be replaced. Um, the current estimates from six to twelve million dollars just to replace the equipment. That's a direct replacement. That's not replacing the ductwork. That's not replacing all the piping and everything that goes along with that equipment. That's just the equipment. Um, this next slide I put together just to kind of show you pretty much what we have in the buildings. Um, RTU rooftop units. We have seven of those. Average life expectancy is 15 years. We're sitting at 23 years. All of our split systems, which are the the heat pumps and everything in the classrooms, and you have the, the units outside that feed them. Um, there's 123 of those. Those are in all the classrooms. They're all 15 years old. Life expectancy, we're sitting at 23 years. We've got some boilers sitting here that are 65 years old, the 1951 one. I was actually telling Dr. Jones earlier. Um, it's actually stamped the City of New York Public Works. We think it may have come out of a building in New York and somehow got shipped to us. We think. We don't know. But uh, the, the tag on it is, is, what, we, is what we suspect. Um, we've got pumps that, are, that pump and circulate all the hot and chilled water throughout the building that are, you know, they're over there. The, they're, so they're 20 years old is the life expectancy. We're sitting at 23. Um, 10 years for some other pumps are sitting at 13 years past their age. All the through wall units, which if you go into the original 1950 section, those bl that blows the, hot, the, the cold and hot air, they're, uh, they're, they're 23 years old, and we're, we've got 15 years old. 15 is when the, the life expectancy of those particular models. Moving on to the roof leaks, they're everywhere. A ask the students. So I, I, they're just such a common occurrence. We don't. People, the teachers have gotten to where they're not even reporting them anymore. Teachers, we're finding te the, the custodians are going in the classrooms to clean at night. And we're finding buckets full of water. They haven't reported of them at all. Um, the roof was, is 23 years old as well. It was a brand new roof in 93. We've, we've done two large repairs over the last two years. And I say repairs, they're not replacement, just repairs of those sections. Uh, we repaired the main office lobby and the entrance, entrance one main lobby and the senior alcove, which is the most recent one. But these pictures, the first one on the left is actually down in the A wing. I don't know whose classroom. It's near Mr. Knight's classroom. 
Um, but that one and the one on the, on the right is actually the main office. This was during their most recent snowstorm. So those classrooms were flooding that we, actually, we just sort of accidentally found while we're pushing snow. And we had to bring in crews and equipment, pull them off of snow removal just to go clean up these rooms that had equipment that was getting wet. So we had to frantically rush to do that. And you can't repair it when there's snow on the roof. I mean, you just have to basically wait it out. And these are common occurrences. This, this next one I thought was pretty ingenious. I am an, I'm an engineer by, by, by education. And so when I saw that, actually I got this report from one of our custodial, custodial supervisors that one night in the, one of the science classrooms, the teacher or student, someone, um, created a, a neat little way to grab the water that was leaking from the windows and the top of the ceiling and funnel it into a trash can so it didn't, it didn't mess up any of their stuff. Again, they did not report this. We stumbled upon it when we were cleaning that night. So it's pretty ingenious, I think. So, I mean, we got some pretty smart kids and, and, uh, and staff members in there. These next slides just sort of show um, the middle picture just showed you kind of where in the building we're looking at. And all these pictures are just kind of showing how bad our roof really is. Um, and you see all the cracks, all the, all the joints that are loose. And these are just not something that our, our internal maintenance staff can repair. These are, these are neat, these, a full roof repair needs to be done. We have caulking that's failing everywhere. You have, um, once you get up there, you start seeing that not only is the roofing, but you have the brick mortar um, around the building is failing, which, you know, that, that's going to have to be replaced at some point. The other thing is that there are all the, all the air conditioning units for all the classrooms. They're sitting on concrete pads. All the concrete pads are failing, so literally the units are starting to, you know, kind of turn sideways that we have to kind of go and reinforce those. So the roof is past its life expectancy and we're going to continue to make, you know, uh, roof repairs as best we can. Thankfully, Dr. Jones and, and Mr. Kimball help us, you know, whenever we need those emergency funds. Um, but the con contingency fund was cut again this year and so that, that's one more thing we're going to have to absorb or find that, f that money or go to city council or whatever we're going to have to do if we do have a major um, emergency this year. So we need to replace this. Um, the, current, the current estimate for the full replacement is a million dollars plus for a, full, for a full new roof at that building. And we, we do have that. I think it's all included in Dr. Jones' CIP plan that, that everybody has. And then moving on just to the other things, like the, the, you know, the building was not designed for 21st century learning. Um, the electrical system wasn't designed for plugging in a MacBook in 20 or, 20 or 30 MacBooks in a classroom. It's not designed for those types of electrical loads. Um, just this year, the fire marshal um, dinged us to the point where he was going to close the auditorium. Literally said, if you don't do it, I'm going to lock it up. Um, so we had to bring all, um, a lot, several classrooms around the, or one classroom around the auditorium and then the stage area of the auditorium up to code, electrical code, or he was going to close it down. And that, we, we, we would have, and he has every authority to do it. Um, so we spent about $11,000 um, at the beginning of the school year to get that done that we didn't plan on. Um, that was just after the inspections during the summer that we were forced to absorb again. Um, the plumbing is failing everywhere. Um, there's, it, we, we have leaks all the time. We have leaks in the, um, in the building where we can't even turn them off because the valves and the ceilings are failing because they're, they're just so old. So life, the life safety system, the fire alarm, the sprinklers, the intercom, I can't even count how much money we've spent just trying to keep them running, which we have to by code. It's not something we can just let slide, right? Um, the elevators, they function. Thankfully, we're not in a five, six story building where we have people that have to use the elevators every day. Most of our kids don't, the few ha have to here and there. Um, and we do, we do keep them up to date, we keep them running. But our custodial staff is sort of a running joke in the department. They refuse to get on them. They put their equipment in there, they send the equipment up or down to wherever they're going, and they get it off. Too many times they've been trapped in there at night, and yet the police or the fire department has to co come and get them out. We're not a multi-story building, so they're just usually just sitting there waiting for a few minutes till somebody gets them out. But it's 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 still one more thing we need to look at. The um, modular classrooms actually were installed in 2003. I thought they were much older, but um, Mr. Kimball dropped off some paperwork to me, and I went through it, and it's 2003. So I was a little off on that. But um, they're leaking. We 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 recoated the roofs um, two years ago. We repainted them all two years ago. Um, but we're still leaking. The, it, it, 
what something to even point out is these these trailers were these modulars were bought at the exact same time as the ones that were TJ that we've already demolished for rotting and leaking. And one of the things that caused it is they at the time when they were ordered they put on metal bars on the windows. The metal bars actually trapped the water, and the water just made everything rot. And we're seeing the same thing. We've removed all the bars. We removed them all a few summers ago, and we discovered that. But you're but now you are. I'm sorry, I'm not even on the right picture. Here we go. These actually are the tra two trailers that are sitting right in front of entrance number two, the main gym, the bus loop. Um, you see, all these were a lot of this wood was repaired and replaced and repainted two summers ago. This this there's a leak right here in this one. This we're going to try to get here in the summer, but this whole wall is basically rotten. Um, I, I don't know what we're going to find when we start pulling it off. We're a little nervous because you know once you open it up, you have to do something. We can't you can't just repaint it and cover it up, right? Um, and the teachers are a little nervous as to what we're going to find. Those teachers know that those are, there are issues in those in those rooms. So we have, Mason's going something has to be done with Mason. I, I didn't realize yet there was something happening tonight about that when we were planning on doing this, but I saw on the agenda um, that there is. Um, so there's my thing to you. Uh, moving on at TJ. Um, you know, TJ's in pretty good shape right now, but we are doing a full HVAC replacement this summer because of the sa same issues at Mason. Um, we're, finally, we're correcting at TJ. So all of the equipment's going to be replaced this summer. Um, they've actually already started some work. Um, we're hoping to get in there. We've already got a plan in place. Um, but that building's going to be packed with people this summer. We're, we're, we're literally going to be running a project and still running two summer schools and daycare and everything else. So it's going to be a very busy campus. Um, so thankfully, we have a good plan in place for that. Um, we, we, the contractor is, is guaranteeing we're going to be ready for school in August. So we're going to hold him at his word. Um, but when you go into TJ, the same thing that are happening at Mason, we're still, we still need to plan for it, TJ. Um, the, that building was in the old original tower, the, not, the second, not the 90s second, uh, second grade hallway that sort of um, protrudes out, but the original tower. Um, it wasn't built for the same electrical, the same electrical needs that we, that we have now. Um, on a daily basis, we get, we get work orders for the circuits are tripped because they plug in a, a, a cart, they plug in something in a room, and they just trip. So the custodians sort of know where to go. We, we do that all the time. Um, so that needs to be done. The plumbing is, is in a, is such a bad situation that we had, we had a leak recently. The only way to fix a leak in that restroom is to turn the water off for the whole building. Well, the old part, not the, the newer part. That's really not an accept, acceptable thing from a facility standpoint, but that was the only option we have because the valves and the ceiling just don't work anymore. Um, so moving forward, we, we have to look at some of that. Even the windows and the doors. Um, the windows, we chose not to, to include those in the, in the um, project back in 2013 just due to budgetary concerns, and they were in, they were in okay shape. But we, are, we, we, we get continued leaks in there during the, wind, during the um, rainy times of the year. Um, so those definitely need to be replaced. In Mount Daniel, we all kind of know where Mount Daniel stands right now. We're just waiting on the, uh, the county. So I'm hopeful that our community, school board, city council will find some way to, to, to fund the GM project. I don't know how you do that. I'm, you know, that, that's not on me. But I don't think we can continue to delay it. And I don't think we continue to push it down to someone else's it, it has to be done. We're either going to pay for it now, we're going to pay for it later, we're going to pay even more later. So um, I think the facilities team will support whatever decision you make. That's, you know, whatever, whatever our community decides on, we'll support. But something has to be done. We need some, some, in, some um, investment in that property. And that's all I have for facilities. So I'm going to take questions on that if you want to, and then we'll go into the security one. Facilities questions? Mr. Reidinger? <coughs> Thanks very much for that informative, if somewhat depressing, yeah, presentation. <laughs> um, and I, I apologize for asking questions, knowing how many people in the audience want to comment uh, uh, publicly. But I do have a few. Um, the The main ones I have really are around GM, and I mean everyone knows the building is failing. Everyone knows we need to move as quickly as possible. But you know, the the most optimistic timeline which some might say is a pie in the sky timeline, but maybe it's realistic, is 2020 you know, for opening. So that's four plus years out. Uh, <clears throat> what are we gonna have to pay anyway? Um, and you, I'm just, 
if we if we have to go four years, that that would assume that we could totally demolish well not totally demolish but totally build a new high school by 2020. If that's not whether or not that's happening, you know, what are we going to have to get done, and what's the most cost-effective way to get what we need to get done to keep the building operating for a minimum of four more years? Well, I, I don't think I could give you a number right now. I mean, it's it's sort of a uh, it depends on what fails first. I mean, you just don't know. Um, but we're going to. I mean, there's going to be some emergency things that are going to come up that I just don't know if we can plan for. Um, that's why it was it was so important we used to have that contingency fund available because there were many years we did pull from it for various projects from boilers at TJ to to a roofing project or whatever um, but everything is failing and everything's the same age that's that's where it that's where it's difficult to really know what's gonna fail first every piece of equipment was bought and installed at the same time all the HVAC stuff um, I mean potentially half of the building could need, could go out at the same time I mean, you just don't know and we could, we could be out. I mean, some of those units are forty, fifty thousand dollars each, depending on where they are. The large rooftop units, some of them, some of them are more than that. So it, it could be. I mean, we could spend several hundred thousand dollars in one year if we have a major event, um, well, just unexpected cost. Let me be a little bit more specific. It seems to me, and correct me if this is wrong, because this is not my area of expertise by any means, but there are a lot of smaller units that can be replaced one by one when they fail. Mm -hmm. um, and they sort of, they're, they're small enough that it probably is smart to replace them when they're past their mean time between failures mm -hmm. <laughs> and you just, you're at end of life. Um, the, the boilers, for example, are something different. Um, and if the maintenance costs are such, you know, at some point you reach a position where even if it's only going to be four more years, it's cheaper to replace a boiler rather than spend a quarter of the cost of the boiler every year to repair it. Um, and because we don't know how long George Mason's going to need to operate, I just what, what I don't want to do is, as you said, it's pay me now or pay me later, or it's pay now or pay later, not necessarily me. Um, but I want to make sure we're looking rationally at what's the most cost-effective way to do this with, again, a, you know, a real life as opposed to a pie-in-the-sky understanding of when George Mason's going to actually be replaced. And if, in fact, you know, for example, and I don't know if this is true or not, but if, if it were cheaper to say, let's just replace the, you know, the 1950s boiler, or if it's in better shape because it was built longer ago, um, the 1970s boiler, then, you know, that may be a, you know, bite your bite your tongue and do it sooner rather than later and you'll actually save money in the long run for the expected amount of time GM's going to operate. And I, that may not be a question you can answer right now. It just, I, I don't want to, I think it's a, it, I think we're going to end up in a bad place if our replacement strategy for equipment is we will only replace or do more than minimal repairs when they're broken, when the device is broken. And that, you know, deferred maintenance has been the, the standard, and it's probably the standard in every single school. I go to meetings all over our region with Fairfax and Loud and the people that everyone assumes has buckets of money, um, but they're in just as bad a situation as we are. They're just building, they're just building more. Um, what we have talked about with, with, with Mr. Kimball and Dr. Jones is we're trying not to overinvest because you don't want to spend money until we sort of know what the plan is with, from the new school. Once we know it, if the new school is not going to be built till 2020 or 2030, then we at least have an idea of what we need to target right now. And it's kind of hard to kind of target anything if we don't have that plan. So we're sort of sitting on our hands waiting on, you know, our, our, the council and the school board and, and the citizens to sort of decide what that plan is. Because, um, I mean, what, do we spend a million dollars? And just so you know, the we did price those boilers out. We were, we were this close. To replacing them and and our boiler company came in and gave us an not ex, not ex, not inexpensive but it wasn't super it wasn't expensive as a full replacement um, to repair those existing boilers we just put in all new computer modules and everything on the head end um, but a full replacement of just that one boiler was half a million dollars because you have to blow out a wall to get it out I mean it's not it's they're not made to just kind of roll out um, and they're all every they're all custom so it, it's a big ordeal um, to do it, and it's a summer project. It's not something you can do during the middle of winter when it goes down. So we we even had talks with 
with the insurance company about what happens if it goes down in the winter. I mean, you can't, there's no, we, can't, we can't repair it in a day. So, you know, the insurance company comes in and helps us with temporary 18-wheelers basically outside that are pumping in heat for us. So we, we ha we've got a lot of this in place, and we've got emergency contracts sort of ready to go if we had to do major roof repairs or something where we can act quickly, but they're not cheap. So it just sort of depends on where we go with the design of the high school or renovation or rebuild or whatever, whatever happens. So I think I can't really plan until I know what you guys and everybody decides. Thank you. Other questions? Mr. Nkuma. So, Sevi, um, a couple of questions first. Uh, funding for TJ, just to be clear, that money was allocated in the original build out. This is a new money. That is, is my understanding. The, for the, the, the HVAC? Yes. Um, that was part of, yeah, I think the city is planning, that's been in the CIP okay, for, for, right, it yeah. was an FY, it's okay. Not, it's not extra, yeah. So that's fine. Um, and then I was gonna ask about the, to piggyback on Mr. Ridinger's questions, uh, deferred maintenance. Mm -hmm. What have you seen match budgeted versus actual over the last two, maybe three years? Just ballpark. What, like actual numbers? Yes. Oh, I don't know, I could ballpark. I'm just sitting here thinking back to when I started 10 years ago. <gasps> And I can remember seeing in the CIP every single year, and Mr. Kimball can probably know better the details, seeing every single year where the elevators were gonna, going to be replaced. And every single year they got pulled out and put somewhere else. So that's you know 150,000 or so per elevator. And that's just, that's just one thing that it's, I mean, it's been on the radar every single year for council and school board and for, what, for a number of reasons, it just goes away and we don't get it until they fail and then we have to ask for it quickly to um to do that I, I guess what i'm trying to establish is where when we've had these emergencies you know are, are we covering them from contingency or are we getting them from other sources we mr Nkuma, we are we are covering the, you know depending on when it happens in the year we're, we're covering them from from other available funds um generally speaking in terms of the contingency that has gone primarily to hiring staff and for student student related issues um a lot of the the funds which we've been able to redirect towards the facilities have come uh from the salaries and benefits areas from you know from from turnover that that and as Sevi mentioned a lot of these issues make themselves evident mid-year at which point all of our staff has been hired and um, you know we, we can identify you know where there might be some might be some underspending and then simply redirect the monies um, from those locations so uh, under the, the the current scenario or should I say what we're looking forward to with the with the with in the next in the coming year um, how tight are we for emergency funding in if, if anything were to happen very tight very tight I guess mr. Ridinger pointed out yeah. four years um, and I and I don't know that it will be all four years because I'm, I'm going to assume if we have a two-year construction period if we get to that point we're probably looking at maybe two years because we're gonna blow, blow it up anyway and 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 use the second two years but I, I'm, I'm looking at I didn't say Definitely two years because we're not building a school this year or next year. Um, but if we ha if we we can come to some agreement about financing it and get started in a couple of years, um, what some some what 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 do we think we we would need between now and then? And that's an optimistic scenario. I I agree. I mean I, I admit that that's optimistic. I mean, realistically, in, in speaking with, uh, with, with Brian Valor, our maintenance supervisor, I, I, I'm sure we're going to, if, if, if the plan is, say, four or five, six years, whatever, we could easily spend two or $300,000 to in re repairing and, and upgrading some of the HVAC systems in the classrooms. I think the classrooms, are, they're all failing all the time. Um, I think most teachers have sort of gotten used to it, so it's either too cold, too hot, or it's super humid, one, you know, one or the other. Um, but they all need to be replaced. And I think we've, we've got an idea of which ones are the worst. And we would try to just maybe repair and replace those as best we can. Um, but yeah, probably a few hundred thousand dollars. And I might add, we do talk about this all the time. And one of the things about replacing the HVAC units is we're having so many leaks in the building from what's in the ceiling. So if you just go in, we really need to do at Mason what we have done at 
TJ and what we've done at Mount Daniel like last summer where we ripped the entire ceiling out, everything that was up in the ceiling came out so that you've got new duct work, you actually have the condensation lines, and Sevi, you could speak to that, but if we just replace the units, we can keep the rooms cool, but we're not going to fix the water pouring through the lights. And, and Mr. Ankuba, just to, as, as an addendum to my previous comments, um, we have uh, both the, the year that's wrapping up and in, in, the, in the upcoming year, uh, about $175,000 that is specifically earmarked to address uh, facility issues, whether it be roofing, equipment, um, paving. But, but honestly, you know, the money does, does go um, very quickly. Uh, and Sevi, not to put you on the spot, but I'll, I'll put you on the spot. Um, I, I, several years ago, I, th I thought I was very, very clever and in, in terms of, you know, problem solving and thinking, well, you know, what if we bought a new boiler at, for, you know, for George Mason, couldn't they use that boiler in the new building? Or, you know, if there's a generator, you know, at one building, well, why can't we, you know, move that generator over to another building? Can you speak to, speak to that? Well, I mean... <laughs> The main reason is, you know, the, the equipment that we buy is generally designed specifically for that project. We even ran into that, that at TJ where we had assumed we could use the, the, the generator that was actually purchased maybe six, seven years ago. That I think I, I was, was it a little longer? I was fairly new at the time. Um, but it wasn't going to be large enough for that, to meet that new addition. So we would either have to have two that you have to maintain or you just buy a new one. So that, and that's kind of where it, where it is. Um, you can't, it's very difficult to buy a piece of equipment saying you're going to put it in another one unless you've got, already got the plans for the other one and you're, you're talking to those builders and those designers and they're telling you what to buy to, to make it work. Um, Other questions? Uh, just a couple of questions. Thank you for your presentation, Mr. Padilla. I, the first is I would note the buildings that have the most problems all date back to the 50s and I think what you're seeing is some of those were, re were remodeled in the 90s and here we are pushing 2020 and I think that's an interesting tale about capital investment uh, over the years and, and what happens when there, there are peaks and troughs there. I think what, what Mr. Reidinger is asking for and I think it's I think it's right, is, is some kind of triage plan for assessing. Uh, obviously, if something goes wrong catastrophically, that's, that's going to be reality. But I know we've talked about this with respect to transportation, but does it make sense on the basis of a, a triage exercise to, to create some sort of ongoing maintenance fund uh, of some kind, either in, in the CIP or, or elsewhere? Because I think this is not just a little bit of noise. There's a lot of signal in this, and I think it's staring us in the face that it's, it's more likely than not some expensive events are going to happen within the next four to five years, which means that's, that building is likely going to be still in use. And, and I think we need to face that head on. So, um, you know, I would, I would ask you and Dr. Jones to find a way to, to do something on that front to say we've looked into our crystal ball as best we can it looks like the number is going to be x so we want to allocate you know one quarter x over the next four years as kind of that fund to to reserve for something like that i guess the other question i have is looking ahead for meh uh, buildings age just as everything else does when when will we start to see events there at meh or, or is that are, are we still outside the window there, or, or is that going to be coming? Uh, is that going to be getting attention soon as well? Well, I, I, I think I think MEH. It, you know, it's interesting. I, I mentioned this to, to Tony recently. Um, Brian, our maintenance supervisor, he's like, you know, the the average life expectancy is 15 to 20 years for HVAC, and you know that building is approaching is, is over 10 years old, or not, not 10 years old. Was it built 2005? Yeah, so we're going on 11. So yes, yeah, so we're we're approaching that that time, and that's our one of our newest facilities. And you know, um, one of the problems I think that we've we've always faced, and we're trying to overcome it now, is the deferred maintenance, is the 
not replacing the air filters as often as they should have been replaced. And we've, we've changed all that and we've upped all that, which is more, we're more expensive. We're spending more money. Um, but that's, that's helping, keep the, you know, you, you look at Mary Ellen, if you ask the teachers now, um, the issues that we were having over there consistently for the last few years, even when it was a fairly new building, um, which were mainly due to lack of maintenance, um, we, we think we've, we've finally tackled. And it's been through that added stuff, but we only have so much, so many staff. So you have one or two staff that are—that's all they're doing, two or three times a month. That's all they're doing are filter changes and things. So they're not doing other things. They're not working on the trailers. They're not, um, and they're in one building. So I think that's that's a big that's a big hurdle for us. Is is just we don't have enough staff, and then you don't have enough staff that are actually qualified, maybe, to know that H to have HVAC qualifications because everybody can't do it. Um, you have to have certifications, and then you have, there's, there's, there's different levels of what you do. So th we, we do contract a lot of that out if we need it, um, but we try, try not to if we don't have to. All right, well, thank you. Uh, if there are no more questions, we can go on to part two. All right, part, part two. This is the security. So everybody knows Ms. Minifield if you go over to the high school. Um, so I, what I want to do with this is just sort of give you an overview of what the actual security services or security department really is because a lot of it's sort of it's changed drastically in the last couple of years um, to sort of give you an idea of what we actually do and have um, currently we only have one actual FCCPS staff member that is really assigned to security and is at Mary Ellen um, all the others are contracted through Securitas we have 10 total Securitas during the day right now three at Mason during the day one in the evening one at and during the day and evening at Mary Ellen two at TJ now um, and one at Mount Daniel, one at Thackeray. And summer, you can see we have um, six working uh, with a reduced staff for the summer school. Um, kind of moving into what the, the departmental responsibilities, and I say department um, because it's not, a, it's not really a department, it's me. <laughs> it's, it's me, and I have like a .15 of, of a person that works for me that sort of that helps with fingerprinting and badging and other things in, in, in addition to her million other duties that are completely unrelated to this. Um, but every single new applicant that comes in we have to fingerprint. Um, we, have, we issue all the, the, the ID badges to every single staff and you have to program all of that. Um, all the volunteers that come in every single t every time you go and volunteer in a class or your teacher sends me 25 or 30 and they're every everybody's grandmother we have to manually do it's 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 myself and and, and this one other person um, it's a lot of time I mean a lot of time to do all of that in addition we're also maintaining our camera systems that are 24 7 our access control which is our prox card readers our emergency radio systems which includes the bus the bus radios um, we do we have to maintain and monitor it 24 7 just to keep everything running um, thankfully a lot of that you know I get a little bit of help with our IT team um, and, and some of that um, security guards the, their responsibilities as we've as we've changed we didn't have them re you know up until just a few years um, but they, 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 they check our buildings, make sure our doors are staying secure at all times. They're monitoring our security cameras. They're, they're signing in our visitors. Um, they esc they're, they're escort visitors to their locations or make sure the teachers are getting them. Um, they even assist us with the emergency drills. Um, they're walking the property, helping us make sure we don't have, you know, people that shouldn't be on our property walking around, um, which is actually the only reason we've added that second position at TJ this year because of some incidents in the, in the, in the neighborhood this year. Um, they they work they they monitor lunch they they work very closely with their with their principals and our SROs and other police officers that come in and out of the schools. Um, they're pretty pretty much an invaluable tool for us that I can't imagine not having. That we are, you know it's such a new thing for us. Um, the next thing we do, just kind of going over some of the systems that the security services actually does, our access control system. It's a very robust system, and it's a lot. To, it's it's been a long process to get to where we are, and we're way more advanced than most school systems are. Um, with Mason, I mean, you've got how many doors, and all the doors don't have card readers on it, but it really does help us a lot. We've got 60 card readers um, deployed across the district at the various doors. Um, 12 video intercoms, so we can buzz people into the schools. 24/7 um, um, access to this. Um, I can access, I can unlock a door from my phone anywhere in the world. I actually, you know, um, did this. I was, on a, I was on a boat in Puerto Rico two summers ago, and I got a phone call. I don't know how my phone worked, but I got a phone call, and I was able to buzz somebody in. Um, 
but we can do we can do that from anywhere. We um, the good thing about it is we can we can secure our buildings any, any from anywhere at all times. Falls Church Police actually also have access to this. The city uses the same system, and not on our not it's the same system, different network. Um, so in the event of an emergency, they could remote remote in and unlock a door or lock down our building if we had to, you know, God forbid, an active shooter type of scenario or whatever they had to do. Um, moving on to like our radios. Like, like I said, I, the security, we, we maintain the bus radio system. So every single bus radio, every single vehicle radio that we have, I personally am the one who's out pulling them out every summer, reprogramming them. Um, we, 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 we have two towers, as we call them, the repeater towers. So our, our radio system um, communicates with each other. Uh, one on, one's on top of Mary Ellen, one's on top of J uh, Jesse Thackeray. Um, all of our school offices, the admin teams, all the, all the FCCPS vehicles, including the buses, all are fed off of those repeater towers and have, have radios in them. Um, every, the radio repeaters and, or every, are all battery backed up from our, from our UPS devices as well as our emergency generators, which is a, I just finished the generator getting tied in recently. So, you know, in the, in the event of 9-11 type of thing or, or even when the earthquake hit, radio, you know, phones were all down. Our radios will still work. Um, and we've actually done several, um, if anybody was driving around recently, the Peruvian election that was here, you know, uh, last weekend, uh, the police and, and all of our, all the volunteers that work, all the radios that were rented by the Peruvian government that came in, we all use, out, they, they programmed everything to our radio system. So it was a great resource for our police department to be able to use our system and, and be, feel confident that everything's running and working. Um, and we, you know, I monitor that radio system daily from a dashboard in my office so I can see if it's going, if it's down, if we need to correct something, whatever it may be. Um, we also have, a, we maintain a secondary radio system, an analog system, and that's the ones that you'll see the custodians or the playground age or some of them using. They're, it's an inexpensive one, um, but both systems, I can talk to each other on it. Um, our cameras. Um, we've got 141 cameras in the school system. We've got two redundant servers with about 11 terabytes of storage. Um, really need some more storage. Um, the, the, the newer cameras really use a lot of bandwidth now. Um, to cut costs, I pretty much install most of the cameras myself. I'll get one of the maintenance guys to run, a, run the cable for me, and I'll, you'll see me, many people see me up on a ladder installing the camera, programming it, and getting it ready. That's just you know one of the other hats we wear. Um, we, we occasionally do call a contractor for a kind of a complicated install at TJ. We, last year we installed some exterior cameras on the new addition, and they're on the outside on the third floor. It's something I'm not going to do, so we, we hired them to do that for us. Um, but many of our cameras are approaching 12 years old. I mean, that's pretty old for an electronic device. Um, so we, we, we've been trying to replace 10 to 12 cameras per year um, just as they go, at, as they go bad. Um, obviously, we were defunded a, a decent amount this year for cameras. Um, we, we thankfully have had a very generous citizen in the community who has donated um, a, um, 50, about $5,100 worth of cameras to us this year. And he doesn't just go buy a camera. He calls me and, and, and asks, what do, what do I need? And just drops them off. I've come back to my office twice in the last month and found just a sack sitting on my chair with, with cameras. And it's, it's, just, it's an amazing that we have, we have people in this community that would actually step up and do some of those things for us. Um, and just sort of the accomplishments that you know the security service has done is that over this course of this year, uh, all of our cameras are at, can be accessed through a, a remote smartphone app through a secure VPN connection into our network. Um, all of our admins have the ability to do it. I use it on a daily basis. I actually caught someone had broken into the high school through a door last week when I was sitting on my couch at home. Um, before the police even got the alarm, I just happened to be looking. I don't know why I was even on it. Um, so that they work very well. The police dispatch actually is a, it's a new feature this year. Um, they actually have access to our cameras in the police dispatch center. Um, we, we have also installed it in the police um, emergency operations command bus. That's a new thing for them. Um, and it's invaluable during, during, during an emergency. We found that during the, the bomb threat, the emergency bus did not have it. And they could not get on our camera, so we, it was very difficult for them to sort of know what, what, where, what was happening and be able to relay information. So we, we, we corrected that for them. And it's important to note that the police don't have just free range of our cameras. You know, there's, there are FERPA laws out there that, that, you know, things. So there is an MOU in place between the police department and the schools um, that it is to be used only during emergency situations. 
um, or after hours if the burglary alarms are going off or a fire or something like that. And only the police command staff and the dispatchers even have access to it. Um, so the average patrol officer does not. Um, they would have to relay that through um, command. Um, and then the other big thing we've done is we've also added, I, I mentioned our radio systems, we've actually added radios um, into the police dispatch center so that they can communicate with their buses if, they, if necessary during an emergency. They don't monitor them, um, but during an emergency they do have them. And the police command staff actually have them in several of the police supervisor cruisers. So during an emergency, if they pull up on site at one of our schools, they can pull our radio out and they can still communicate with school staff while, um, while the emergency is taking place. And then just the final comment is that I think we're in a much better place with security than we were three, four, five years ago. Um, Securitas really has kind of changed and revolutionized how we sort of operate. Um, a little difficult at first. It was a big change for, for the community to not be able to just walk in the building and, and be questioned when they're coming in. Um, but it's just the necessary times that we live in. Um, we're continuing to improve and improve our systems and upgrade our systems and train for emergency situations um, through our partners at Falls Church Police. And um, just thank you for your continued support and commitment. And that's all I've got. Thank you, Mr. Padilla. Any questions? Mr. Anko. So thank you, Sevi. Uh, first of all, I think, uh, I, I hope the board can have access to this presentation. Um, at least I know I would, but I'm sure my colleagues would all want to see it. It, it takes, uh, looks like we need a deeper dive. Besides yourself, is the backup the police or do you have, if God forbid, Sevy should take a vacation, um, what do we have? Or who do we have? Um, we, thankfully, during, during an emergency situation, if there, if there was one, and I'm not there. Thankfully, Dr. Jones is just, she's everywhere. I mean, you can't, you can't miss her around town. Um, but thankfully, the way, the way our, our, our structure works with, with the, during an emergency, um, the principal is usually the head person to making those decisions and relaying that information to the police. And, and, and so even in an emergency, it's usually the principal and, and them. So if, if one of our systems goes down, um, usually when I leave, I'm, I'm in, like I, I, I took a vacation recently, and I made sure before I left our IT team actually logged into all of my systems and they were monitoring them because a lot of it's just technology related. So just to make sure the systems stay running. Now, what people do with them when I'm not here, I don't know, but, <laughs> but at least they, they, nothing went down. Our radio systems weren't down and our, and our cameras weren't down um, because we do have a little bit of backup there. But I'm having to rely on another department and take them at their, when they're working on SOLs and testing and everything else that they're doing. So there, there's no backup really, it's me. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Any other questions, Mr. Reidinger? Thank you. Uh, much more positive update this time. Thank you. <laughs> um, and and I I think you know had we not had the generous donations, I'm not sure your camera stipend would have been cut. It's clearly an area that we need to make sure that we maintain. Um, a few questions. When in the year was the second security guard added at TJ? I couldn't tell you the month off the top of my head, but it was mid-year, so it might have been around winter break, end of winter break, coming back, something like that. Okay. Uh, the other question I had is, uh, can you ballpark about what the radio systems cost the school system? Well, so the radio system, now, if I had to give you, like a, you want a total, like a total cost of what we have, let's say, in inventory right now, I, I couldn't even begin to tell you. They're just so complicated. But it's the radio system when I first started was sort of a new pet project, and it's been slowly added on over the years. So we didn't just go in and buy everything at once. It's we we, we started buying, piece milling it together, and then we're and then we, ten years later we're at the point where we are now. Um, but on average, I mean, a radio, and just to give you a, a, an example, the radios that that you go and buy, let's say, at Radio, not Radio Shack, they're not even in business anymore, um, <laughs> a Walmart or an REI or something to go camping with, they might, a pair of them might be fifty, sixty, hundred dollars $100. An average radio that we use, because they're secure, I say secure, they're, they're, they're regulated through the FCC, um, they're about $200 a piece. The radios that we use for our, our repeater towers, um, the handhelds that we use, are roughly $800 each. But in comparison, that's because of the frequency range, in comparison, the ones that say the police use, are five thousand dollars each for one radio and we had the option to do those a lot of school systems do use the police um, 
um, bandwidth or types of radios. But it was just too expensive, and I couldn't imagine spending $5,000 a radio when we had so many other needs. So we went with this system um, in, instead. But yeah, it's, I'd have, I could, I'm sure I could probably give you a ballpark if I went and sat down and did the math. And if, if you want me to send that to you after, afterwards, no, it's, I'm it, happy to you, do it. You don't need to waste the time. It was just okay. one of the ones I wanted to get a sense of. There's a, there's a general trend in emergency communications generally to move to COT solutions as opposed to um, public safety type radio solutions because the commercial infrastructure is getting so capable, recognizing that in events like 9-11, the cell phone infrastructure cuts down. It, it's just worth keeping an eye on whether it makes sense to transition to those at some time. But it, at $500 for your base stations and $200 for your um, radios, it may not. It may, may very well not. But just worth keeping an eye on. Yeah, thank you. Any other questions? And, and I'm going to get this re this report sent over to Marty, and she'll show up. I was still working on it, kind of right at the end, so I didn't want to send a one that was a little off. But all right, thank you. Just one last question, Mr. Pedia. Uh, oh, any any significant unmet needs, priorities in terms of the security? I mean, for example, one one question: all night security. Is this all, is it all night securitas presence at MEH and no, 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 no. evening? Um, what so does we have evening two mean? There's two shifts um, at Mason and, and Mary Ellen, is on, and, they, and they come in right when this first shift is leaving, like 4.30ish or so, and they stay till I think, around 10. Okay. Um, so basically when our evening activities are general, generally winding down, that's when they're, that's when they're leaving. Um, they're not there at after hours. Uh, the police monitor our burglary alarms and have access to our cameras, so if something were to happen, they're sending officers out to respond. Okay. Um, and just, I guess, one last question. There are, I don't know how many, depends on who you ask, 90, 77, some, something mm -hmm. in that ballpark doors at George Mason. Um, those frequently come up as a security challenge. A, a what? A, a security challenge. The, the what? I'm sorry. Uh, the doors the at George the Mason. Doors. I guess I was missing oh, the microphone yeah, yeah. there. Um, do we need all those doors? Are there, uh, are, are there safety improvements we could make simply by rationalizing the access? Well, unfortunately, the way that building is built, there's no way to close off the doors. I mean, for fire egress reasons, there's a reason they're there. Um, if I was building a new building, you would not have even a fraction of that many doors. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost impossible, which is one of the reasons we've had to add that those extra security guards at Mason. If we had a brand new building that was stacked, say, like Mary Ellen, you wouldn't need three full-time day shift officers working just that one property necessarily. Um, Part, one of the things they're doing nonstop is just walking around the door perimeter, just checking them. Before we had them, it was all day long. You know, a student goes out, the door doesn't shut, or they prop it open, or a teacher does the same thing because they don't want to take their keys or their badge. Um, so, could, I'd love to. I'd love to brick up a lot of those doors, but we, but unfortunately, we, I mean, we wouldn't be able to. Um, but a lot of them are, are very difficult to secure. Um, so. That's just one extra thing. I didn't, I didn't put that in the, in, in the list of things, but that's one more thing that that building is really suffering on, is, is just the, the doors. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a problem. Okay. Well, well, thank you again. I know it's a bit of a coincidence that we have our later agenda item tonight in your presentation. Uh, so thank you again for staying this, this late, and uh, thank you for your hard work. Now we come to item four on our agenda, public comment. Uh, in accordance with School Board Bylaw 2.30, the time for each speaker is limited to three minutes. Additional written statements may be submitted to the clerk for dissemination to board members and for the record. Uh, if you would like to speak, uh, please fill out a comment form and pass it on up. Uh, and with that, we'll start with uh, Kathleen Kabuchi. Welcome. Thank you. I made it. <laughs> um, hello. My name is Kathleen Kabuchi, and I live at 1302 Seton Lane. I stand before you tonight as a 13-year resident of our little city, and I love my home, my neighbors, my schools, my shops and restaurants, my trees and green spaces, and my community. And lastly, I love the people. 
for it is the people that make this a truly unique place to live. Thank goodness I can go to a block party, community center class, or a school event, for instance, and no, it won't be dull. How could it? Chances are I am mingling with some of our nation's most dynamic, educated, imaginative, and inspiring men and women. Frankly, it keeps me on my toes as a person attempting to be a lifelong learner while trying to model integrity and love of neighbor to my three children. So at this point, you're wondering, great, Kathleen, glad to hear it, but what does that have to do with us? I am standing here pleading with you to embrace the knowledge and experience that makes us a town. You have already just demonstrated your love of this city through your public service. As you know, your role as a school board is not to have all the answers, but to seek out information that helps best navigate today's alternatingly calm and choppy waters while setting a course for tomorrow. So pick up some more passengers on your way. I imagine it will be more rewarding and certainly more fun. Here are some ideas. Appoint a group of parents and community members who have extensive experience with budget analysis, expenditures, deliberations, and are familiar with internal versus external audits. Then give them the opportunity to pour over the school's financial data, make recommendations, and then decide whether to act upon them. Let's make the community and city council so confident in the transparency and accuracy of next spring's proposed budget that it fully passes. Let's bypass the drama. Secondly, please vote against going forward with the RFP. I don't pretend to know what is best for our future high school's construction, but I do know that the current process has not given us the right choices. Engage the community, work with city council, and please use your greatest asset, your creative, intelligent, highly qualified citizens to work with you towards a new process and hopefully achieve a vision and plan that future school boards and jurisdictions can only aspire to. I thank you for listening and for your dedication and time to our schools and our community. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Next we have Melissa Dana. I'm Melissa Dana. I live at 314 North Lee Street. Um, so I was reviewing some comments that were made to the school board by Kathy Haleko that resonated with me, and I wanted to repeat them here tonight uh, with a little tweak. Um, her comments were made in reference to herself and to the other principals, and I would like to change the wording a little bit to refer to the community. Um, and what she said was that your job is very hard, but we want you to know that we are happy to give you information whenever you need it. All you have to do is call on us, and you can't know everything. Honestly, please call on us because we are sure you have questions, and we are happy to support you. And with that in mind, I would like to say, and I promise I did not coordinate with Kathleen on this before, <laughs> I would like to ask the school board to convene four task forces or ad hoc committees to deal with four very complex issues that you are faced with. The first one is a task force on the George Mason MEH project, and I would like to ask you to vote against going forward with the RFP and to decouple the PPEA process and establish a committee of uh, the well-educated um, community members uh, that you have to provide input on this very important project, including what amenities do we want to see in this facility and what are we willing to pay for it. The second task force would be one on the Mount Daniel project. I would like to ask you to withdraw the 2232 application and begin a process of collaborating with neighbors and developing a mutual a mutually agreeable plan. And um, I'm sorry that Mr. Sharp left because I think he would be excellent to spearhead either one of the two committees that I just mentioned. Um, another task force that you all uh, would find useful, I think, is a task force on the budget. And that would be to provide answers to the many questions about our finances that arose this budget, se budget season. Um, and to advise the board on whether or not an internal audit could be needed and whether it would be cost effective. 
And then the last task force that I would like to see is one on our instructional technology plan. And um, I would like to re reiterate something one of our kindergarten teachers said. Uh, she said that human capital is far more important than any technology ever could be. With that in mind, we spend $2.3 million a year on technology, which is 4.7% of our budget, at the expense of not hiring all the classroom teachers we need. And I ask you, what benefit does this have my children, to my children? Uh, and I'd like to see a committee address that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next up, we have Frank uh, Michiche. Michiche. Hi, my name is Frank Michike. I'm a uh, nice try, though. I learned. <laughs> I'm, uh, I live at 611 North Oak Street and uh, have two children in the school system, uh, kindergarten and first grade. Um, I've been one of the newly engaged parents, and I've come um, trying to learn as much as possible and trying to be as humble as possible about the difficult choices that you all face and the difficult um, experience process um, here and, and really um, understanding that you've, uh, you know, better minds than mine uh, have tried to tackle these problems. But, and I swore I wouldn't speak for a few meetings, um, but having now sat through a few hours of debates about the proper amount of copiers in the schools and, um, and then seeing that presentation tonight, it pains me. If you dropped someone from outer space to Falls Church and they heard that budget discussion that we had where we were literally talking about um, the proper number of copiers and, and how much paper and toner, et cetera, um, we should be using in order to squeeze out um, some savings. But to see those pictures uh, of the facility and to hear these stories and to hear the things that are now just taken for granted in terms of leaks in the ceiling and, you know, I guess humbly I'm suggesting whatever we're doing right now is not working. And um, I appreciated the earlier speaker saying that um, there's a lot of resources, a lot of uh, active, engaged parents who want to help make this better and help you all do your jobs. I have no interest in assessing blame, but I really want us to get our act together on this. And, so, and I think I would, my, my takeaway would be um, let's just get everything on the table and let's figure out how we move forward um, in a way that allows us to address these types of issues that allows us to build the facilities that we need um, and and really um, reach our promise as a community so thank you for your service and um, i hope to be able to help in any way possible as do i think all these other um, newly and previously engaged citizens so thank you thank you very much uh, next, we have Christina Rice. Christina Rice, 106 South Lee Street. And I'm back to talk to you more about the Special Education Committee. Uh, last week, I put my own recommendation forward that you uh, read the 2015 annual report and consider the recommendations since uh, the uh, school board supposedly waived the uh, annual report from the Special Ed Committee. And um, I hope that you'll still consider doing that. Um, also, I had uh, to remind you, ask that uh, you ensure that uh, Special Education Advisory Committee members actually do the outreach that they're mandated to do by the Virginia Department of Education to all special education parents to determine what the needs are of the students. Um, but tonight, uh, I wanted to use my time to talk to you about the liaison. I understood uh, from John Lawrence last summer, I had a meeting with Becky Smurden, uh, Tony Jones, and John Lawrence, uh, that the liaisons uh, actually rotate so that the different board members can learn about the different areas of needs in the schools. And that didn't happen this year. John Lawrence stayed on with our committee. Um, we were looking forward to seeing new faces in January. That did not happen. Uh, we need a liaison to take that position seriously and act 
in the way a liaison does, and that is to be a bridge to bring back information to the full board. Of course, you can always read the minutes of our meetings that are to be posted publicly, and I would like you each to consider doing that. Um, we need a liaison that respects the integrity of the committee and an administration that respects the integrity of the committee and does not block having uh, subcommittees so that the committee can actually function and complete tasks. We had worked for over a year and a half on two uh, brochures, informational brochures for parents, and uh, those were um, knocked off the boards. And I was recently with uh, four special education mothers who I never discussed the subject with, who said what we really need are brochures. We need who to go to, when, where, what we're supposed to do. And this was specifically in reference to transition in high school um, for college-bound students with IEPs and um, just knowing uh, how to go through the transition process. Um, so, uh, that's my three minutes. I'll be back to talk to you some more. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Rice. All right. Next is item five on the agenda, the closed meeting. Would somebody move us into close, please? I'll do it. Uh, Mr. Chair, pursuant to the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, I move that the board convene a closed meeting for the following purpose, to discuss or consider the identified subject matter, personnel under section 2.2-3711 subsection A, section 1, in particular, staff appointments, staff reassignments, staff resignations, staff retirements, EPED assignments, and advisory committee appointments, and 2.2-3711 section A, subsection 7, consultation with legal, counsel, employed, or retained by public body regarding matters required requiring the provision of legal advice, specifically the Mount Daniel project. Thank you, Mr. Ankuma. Do I have a second? Second. Mr. Kimball. Yes. Mr. Ankuma. Aye. Mr. Castillo. Aye. Mr. Castillo. Aye. Ms. Gill. Aye. Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Reitinger. Mr. Webb. Yes. Great. Thank you. All right. We will now go into closed. And we will be back shortly. I hope. All right, would somebody move us into open and certify the closed meeting? I move that we reconvene an open session. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstentions? No. All right. Uh, Mr. Chairman, whereas the Falls Church Public School Board has convened a closed meeting in this state, pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Falls Church Public School Board hereby certifies that, to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirement by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and two, only such business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Thank you. Do I have a second? Second. Okay, Ms. Gill, tie goes to her. Uh, Mr. Kimball. Yes, Mr. Ankuma. Aye. M Mr. Castillo. Aye. Ms. Gill. Aye. Mr. Lawrence. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. Yes. Mr. Webb. Yes. Great. Thank you. There's a boy in this hallway. <coughs> All right, next we come to approval of the consent. Uh, we come to the consent agenda. I would seek unanimous consent to approve the consent agenda as proposed. Seeing no objection, so order. Thank you, Mr. Webb. Um, next, we come to item eight on our agenda. And that concerns our old friend, the approval of issuance of the detailed RFP for the GMMEH PPEA project. Um, that caption notwithstanding, um, when we met last week, 
and had a vote. We ended up in a tie. And Mr. Horn will tell us that we have to vote on that again. And the motion on the table at that time was to not issue the re detailed RFP. I think we can get Mr. Kimball to reread the motion if that is handy. Yes. Um, and then to suspend or terminate the, the PPA process. Um, Mr. Horn, at, at this point, do we go straight to voting? Do we have a discussion? What do we do? There have been some developments since our meeting on the city council side. I don't know whether we discuss those. The board's free to discuss before okay. it brings the matter back for a vote. It just will be voted on tonight. Okay. Very well. Um, as you all may know, our colleagues at City Council met last night to discuss the detailed RFP for the George Mason MEH PPEA project. And because it is joint, it does require the consent of both bodies to proceed. Uh, the result of last night's meeting at City Council was to defer the process, I believe, for two weeks and to uh, gather, uh, was to request that the superintendent and the city manager gather additional information that would describe uh, various facets of the options that are out there and that could include uh, more details about the relative costs of various options. Dr. Jones, I don't know if you've had any further discussions with Mr. Shields today or anything to add about the, the nature of the information that's sought. It sounds like the bodies would, would work that out. Uh, and that was a four to three vote yesterday on the part of the city council. And so with that background in mind, I don't know if there's any discussion. Anybody have any thoughts to offer? Mr. Lawrence? Well, Mr. Anderson? So I was absent last week, so I guess I would uh, appreciate sort of like a, an, an update on what, what the motion was and what we're looking at. Mr. Kimball, could you read the motion to Mr. Ankuma? Certainly. To us all? Yes. Uh, the motion is that the school board discontinue the PPEA process and not go forward with the detailed RFP. Thank you. Uh, yep. Well, I always like to talk. No, I prepared some remarks. Um, I hope those are not all the remarks. And they are voluminous. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, no, um, I prepared these while feeding my children dinner, which they did not eat. So I apologize if it's all disjointed. Um, so tonight, for the third time, I'm voting to discontinue the current PPA process for a new George Mason High School and renovated Mary Ellen Henderson Middle School. I've come to this decision after many meetings, extensive review of both proposals, including the financial implications for our city. We received additional information this week that further solidified my decision that we should discontinue the current PPA process. Instead, I advocate that we decouple the school and commercial aspects of this project. This does not mean that I am in favor of the school board and the general government proceeding on completely separate paths. Rather, we must ensure that when we proceed with a decoupled project, we actively involve the entire community in what that process will look like, including our colleagues on city council and community members on the planning commission and EDA. This must include a discussion of affordability and scenarios for different levels of build out for the high school. This will take time. It cannot be rushed. And I oppose the proposed timeline of issuing an RFP in July with a referendum in March of 2017. We must engage in meaningful and data-driven discussions with the community before we proceed. We need to carefully examine how we will pay for the new high school and whether we will build the new school all at once or in phases. Many in town, including myself, would like to see an aquatic center as part of the new high school, but how much does that cost? What are we willing to give up to get an aquatic center or other features that may be on the chopping block? These are questions that must be answered with hard numbers, careful analysis, and open, transparent communication with our community, not generally and aspirationally in another visioning session. It is clear that we need to address the condition of George Mason as quickly as possible, and I would love to sign off on, an, on issuing a revised RFP and move forward with a new school. 
The school board and city council have devoted over seven months to review of the two proposals we received in response to our initial RFP. However, my duty is to the students and citizens of Falls Church City, and when I ask myself, is this project affordable, responsive to our student and community needs, and one that my constituents would approve at referendum, the answer is no, and therefore I must vote against continuing down this path. Thank you, Ms. Gill. Other comments? Mr. Reitinger. Just briefly, um, I, I think I've, I've probably bored this committee and the members of the audience with my opinions on this issue um, before, so I'm not going to go through them. I would just like to suggest that depending on what the outcome is, I think it is worthy of not immediately moving on to the next topic, but talking about next steps, again, depending upon what the outcome of the vote is. Thank you. Mr. Ancona. So, Ms. Gill's uh, comments are hard act to follow, but I, I just made the notes, so I'll, I'll go through them very briefly. My issues are uh, one that, at this point, I don't see, to begin with, a lack of demonstrated alternatives. And for me, even if it's only for an, an analytical or comparison purposes, to give the citizens a choice, um, and secondly, to put the PPA process in whatever light it may, it, may, it may shine. Personally, I think the PPA process removes some of the risks of going it alone, but with the right partner and the right circumstances, and I'm not sure that's the case now. I have concerns about the funding. Um, I, I think the estimates come across as a little rosy. I, I don't see a sensitivity analysis uh, coming from city staff. I'm not sure what, there, there's no, I, I haven't seen anything to what happens if there's a if interest rates go up um, or if revenues for debt service decline. Um, I'm concerned about the assumptions that the developers, uh, that the, the assumptions about developers and what they will do and what they will not do. There'll be question marks about the the, the land sale and the values that will derive at the time. Uh, I'm not sure from what I've heard that the community has the appetite to absorb all hundred and. The, the figure we've been given, which is $112 million in debt in terms of the taxes and the debt service. So for me, I would recommend that if the current bidders will bear with us, I say we get estimates and quotes for three options. One, a renovation, as bad an idea as that may seem. Two, some sort of a design-build process. And three, the PPE. So um, here, here's where I'm at. Uh, will there be a new school? I believe there will be. Is the PPE process the only way to go? I don't think so. And is it worth proceeding to the design, uh, the, the, the detailed RFP stage? For me, not without knowing what the alternatives are. So what I'm requesting is uh, additional options for the, everybody to consider, both the school board and the community, line them up against the PPE and see which one's best for us. But uh, at this stage, uh, while I would not, while I'm not hard on killing the PPA process, I wouldn't go any further without getting some alternatives. So that's where I stand. Thank you, Mr. Ankuma. Other comments? Mr. Lawrence. Um, just a couple things. Frankly, I expected to come here tonight to vote to end. Um, I didn't expect the city council last night to say we're going to get new information in two weeks. So I, I find it hard to vote to end if the city council expects information that will inform a decision they're going to make in two weeks. And I'm not really sure what they're going to get, but I'd, I would find it hard to say whatever information you think is important enough to make you delay your decision isn't important enough for me to wait to make my decision. Um, but my, my bigger point is what Michael talked about is where are we going? It's, it's one thing to say we're not going to do something, but I want to know where we're going because two weeks ago we met with the council and they were saying, well, not they, members of the council were saying we can afford 40 million. Well, 40 million doesn't get us a new high school. It doesn't get us a renovated high school. It's, well, you, you saw the presentation earlier. It'll get us a new roof, heating and air conditioning, and right now, if we had a referendum that said, do you support $40 million for the high school? I'll be blunt. I would vote against it because that will not do anything we need. But what the council hasn't said is what, what can we afford? And that will decide how we're going to go forward. If it's $40 million, 
we are not able to go up. If we can't go up, we're not going to have land to sell, so we're not going to get revenues from the land. We're not going to put commercial development on that land. We're not going to get tax revenues going further to help pay off the school. So I, I want to know what the process going forward is. I'd rather vote for something rather than just killing something. And my other concern that I mentioned before that came out of the meeting, when we do decouple, and frankly, we're going to, we're relying on commercial development to be willing to buy land and not be able to use it for two to three years because the school's going to be on it. So they're, they're being asked to front money. If, if it's 10 acres, let's say it's four million an acre, you know, they're fronting $40 million so that we can build a new school to free up land. It's their land that they can't develop for two to three years. I really want somebody to explain who has deep pockets like that that would be willing to do it. Because I think what it comes down to is if the land is worth $40 million, we're going to take a huge discount. It might go for $20 million because there's no way we would get somebody to do that. So I want to know where we're going if we're not going with a $112 million high school and development in the schools together. Because right now what I feel is people are simply saying we don't like the one thing, so let's get rid of that. But we got to figure out where we're going. And I don't feel we know. I, I honestly don't think the information that the city manager gets in the next two weeks is going to tell us where we're going. And I think next two weeks we're going to admit that we've reached the end of this process. But right now, given the fact that the council felt that whatever he was going to find was important enough for them not to vote yesterday, which I said last week I expected them to go forward on, um, I don't see how we could vote to kill it now if they expect information that could inform their vote. So, no, I will not support this tonight, and I expect it to. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Mr. Webb. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for me, of seeing what the council did last night, it, it leave, leaves me with a, a lot to wonder of what they expect to hear because we've been working on this for the last seven months, and we've asked the same questions as many different ways as we possibly could. So I, I have no idea what Mr. Shields has to present that's going to be very different than what we've already heard. So I think we are, I agree with, with both of you and Mr. Nkuma that where are we going to go? And I do want to do that as well. Um, I think what many of us here kind of got caught in the, when the unsolicited proposal was brought to us, <coughs> we kind of got kind of caught in a, maybe we can actually do this and find partners to to help us foot the bill that we for more than a decade have always run into the wall of how do we pay for this we know we need to do it and seeing those pictures tonight you know re redoubles for me that we have to figure out something to do because we are george mason is steadily coming apart at the seams and I think we do need to, as soon as possible, come up with some more options. I wish that we, in the beginning of this process, were more, I guess, focused in looking at potential renovation, um, looking at new build, looking at phasing throughout these last um, seven months that we've been doing this but we didn't and i think we all you know we're at the point where we are now uh, assuming and thought that we would be at a, a point to be able to vote for a positive for moving forward with george mason i don't um i think by stopping this process now i think we can move forward with looking at where do we go from here questions and focus solely on what do we do from here questions opposed to trying to figure out how do we continue to extend the life of the current process we are in and even hearing last night the majority of those of the council even were at a point of I don't see this moving forward and we're split on where to go last night and they a split vote gave giving an additional two weeks I don't know what two weeks is going to do for us other than just continue to extend 
and give us more and more time for George Mason to come more and more apart, that I think we just need to move forward, put some options, some true options on the table um, of decoupling, looking at on our, and I think we are going to have to focus more on our part, which is the designing the school. That is our responsibility of figuring out designing the school, having a true conversation with the community, figuring out what they're going to be willing to do. Yes, they all want the pool, but ultimately there we're going to have to have a number that to show them, okay, if you want a pool in this new facility, this is how much it's going to cost. This is how much it's going to be an additional five cent, whatever, on the tax rate. Are you all willing to, to take this additional cost on? I think that's the open and honest conversation that I think we have to have now because by doing this process, we did not necessarily, we, we gave some, but we didn't give full opportunities for them to, um, to give that feedback because ultimately they are going to be the ones, we all are going to be the ones who are going to ultimately be paying for this project. Uh, and if they're willing to, to absorb the additional dollar, of, you know, five cents or, 10 cents, whatever it may be at the end of the day, you know, that's their option to do. Uh, and no one going into it with both eyes wide open to see that, I think we'll, we'll be at a better, better place. But we have to figure out a plan with George Mason. George Mason is not in a, of going in that building and, and seeing last year where kids are sitting with blankets wrapped around them, that's unacceptable. That is unacceptable for our students to have to sit in, in classrooms to learn with blankets wrapped around them because there's no heat in the in those sections of the building. So we have to, and I think by us knowing that, I think hopefully we all will come together and work as quickly. I think July is a, is too quick of a transition period, but I think we need to work as quickly as possible and bringing folks in as quickly as we can to have these conversations and ultimately come up with a plan and move forward so that everyone is on the same sheet of music of what we're going to be spending, what the tax rate is going to be to pay for this. When we go to referendum, they all know exactly what's out there so they can be informed of what they're going to do. But I think right now what we're doing is just kind of delaying where we are. And I think uh, us moving forward, I think really taking the leadership on this, voting tonight to, to to end this, I think is us stepping up to take on that leadership opposed to just continuing to drag this out longer and longer, and I don't think we should be doing that at this point anymore. Other comments? Mr. Reitinger. So at this point, I will say something. Um, I, I would like to associate myself with everything Mr. Webb just said. Uh, I think the time has come for leadership and courage. I think the city council has decided for whatever reason that they don't want to own this decision that they'd like us to. And I actually think that's right. I mean, it's a school we're talking about here. We ought to own the decision whether we're going to proceed or not. I agree very much that we need to find an alternative path that will succeed. But it is my considered, and at this point, um, strongly considered belief that we will be unable to fully explore all the alternatives and options while the PPA EA is still out there. We, we'll, we'll have discussions, but it, it will hold as a drag on us. People will worry when they're engaging in discussions, whether they're talking about protected material or not. I think whatever we do, we can say that there is no additional information that will come to light that will change our view on whether it's okay to proceed to a full detailed RFP with only two bidders. I don't think it is a reasonable thing to do. I think we will move more quickly and I think we will have better options if we explore alternatives, not in the shadow of a still pending but clearly dying request for detailed proposals. So I think it's time to put it down it's time to move forward to have a full exploration of alternatives because I think we will get done with the process faster and we'll have better decisions to make. 
So I'm happy if we vote down the detailed RFP, and I think we ought to have a discussion about what's the next step. How do we move forward? Do we bring the Planning Commission in? Do we establish a new joint group with the City Council? I think we ought to do all of those things, um, but I just think we'll do it better and faster if we make the decision tonight and show some courage and some leadership about what we think is best for the city. And that's my opinion. Mr. Chair. Mr. Chair, Mr. I have a question for Mr. Horn. Mr. Horn, does the decoupling preclude us from going into another PPEA if we decide to build just a school? Uh, short answer is no. Once this procurement process is concluded, terminated, um, the board would be free to consider any procurement method that meets the requirements of the Virginia Code, PPA being one of them. So you could be back in a PPA in a, in a, in a different procurement process. Does that make sense? In a different timeline with a different project. Okay. Thank you. That answers my question. Thank you. Okay. Mr. Lawrence. Well, and I'd like to point out that the PPEA process is, is getting attacked. It's not the problem here. We, we've used the PPEA process successfully time after time after time with MEH, with TJ, with Thackeray. The PPEA mechanism isn't the problem. The way this project was put together was the problem. So I just want to make sure, and, and you know, our motion says, you know, stop the PPEA process, and it's really not. It says stop the current PPEA process. Right, but not everyone keeps any saying PPA process. let's stop the PPEA, and I just want to make sure that people know it's it's not the PPEA that that is the problem, and just so that if we do go forward with another PPEA process, people aren't suddenly surprised and saying we didn't expect that. Mr. Pettis, do you have anything to add on this? No, because I'm still not entirely, like, I don't entirely understand what is going on. I'm kind of welcome, confused. Welcome jo to the club. Join the club. That is, a, that is, a, that is a statesmanlike answer. You will do very, very well. Sm so, Look, very I smart move. <laughs> I know Mr. Kemble tried to explain it to me, and it kind of makes sense, but I'm still confused, so... Well, and that, that uh, your remark, uh, uh, Mr. Scharf has a sign in his class saying, uh, trust those seeking the truth, doubt those who think they found it. And, and I think that's a, that's a good theme here. Um, I think we should just start numbering our remarks. So Mr. Ridinger can say one, and I'll say four, and Ms. Gill can say three. Um, I don't know the answer here, and I don't, as I've said, if you look at those numbers that Mr. Padilla put up you know, in, in the Korean War era, except for the steel strike, which slowed things down a little bit, um, there was a massive amount of investment in infrastructure in Falls Church and elsewhere, um, and there was, uh, there was a bond issued for three times the school's budget, you know, I think in 1951 or so, which would translate in this day and age to a $150 million bond issue. Um, back in that day, uh, our, our forebears saw fit that the federal government would provide substantial aid for school construction given the, the baby boom. Um, we now are coming to the end of life of not one, but two and to some extent three buildings built from that era. And the, the question I have in my mind is, as hard as it may be to admit, what if this process is the least bad option? What if it's the only way to get some semblance of a school um, that's viable for 50, 50 years um, that would not break the back financially of the city? Um, and we don't know the answer to that. And 
to Mr. Webb's question, what information could we get? I, I think the answer is not about this project in and of itself, but it would be to engage a, an architectural slash construction firm um, with expertise in the field to, for public consumption, produce uh, numbers, information, financing estimates that would tell us what the options are and, and I would dare say let's ask them to be bold what would the UVA Virginia Tech site look like in that mix uh, that that continues to float out there I know we've had difficulty getting traction with that but there's a nice building there depending on what our budget is could could we make an offer that uh, that they would not refuse I, I don't know the answer to that Renovations, my understanding is that number would be in, you know, just south of 100 million. Uh, but again, I think it would serve us in the community well if we would get more information. So we can say, here are all the options. Here's what a run at the UVA Virginia Tech site would look like, and here's what pressure it would relieve. Here's what a renovation would look like with additional construction because we'll need more space. Um, and, and then there's the issue of decoupling. Um, as far as I know, the, the plan for decoupling is to do it and then figure out what that entails because as attractive as the concept of decoupling is, the, the two projects remain very inextricably intertwined because as far as I can think this out, you would float a bond for phase one of the construction, which would have to be carefully planned because any development would have to take place on land that would be vacated. Phase two would then, I guess, take that land and finance and, and be financed by that, the sale of that land. That raises significant questions. What would the cost of phase two be and would the development be able to finance it? I don't know, but, but to say decoupling would somehow result in a process that is without friction or risk, I think we don't have the information for that. It may well, and if it does, I'm all for it. But I, I think there is great merit to having a more data-driven, robust set of financial cost estimates, timelines, bake in maintenance costs for George Mason um, and let's that will be an investment that will pay great dividends Mr. Webb suggested and I, I think the retrospectroscope bears out that this would have been a great thing to do several months ago or maybe even a year ago to, to get a little more of a menu of what are our options what are the tax consequences what are the timelines and how best would we be able to proceed and let's lay that out for the community. I, I think that is a predicate to then the questions of what, what kind of ultimate buildings would we get out of the process. And we can throw into that mix the pool option. Uh, because I think, the, the, I, I think everybody would like an aquatic center. I know Arlington has wanted an aquatic center for a long time. And yet they've stumbled on cost issues for their aquatic center and they're very different from the one that we would have but if it's 10 million would you do it if it's 20 million would you do it if it's 12 we don't know I think if we get a little more information about that we'll all be better served and we can have a better sense as a community what we want um, to Mr. Ridinger's point that this is something that the school board should own I I, I think this is the, the this is something that our entire city has to come to grips with certainly the school, the high school is a driver of this, but I think we need um, buy-in on all fronts. And I think the city council's, I would say, very surprising decision last night to me to take a pause and, and get a better sense of what the landscape really looks like, I think is the right decision. Because again, there is, there is nothing forcing our hand and given how little I think we really do know about what path is the best, I think we should maintain our options rather than narrow them down because otherwise jettisoning one at this point suggests that somebody has a better plan and I just don't know that's the case. Again, 
I, I would love to see a better plan and I look forward to seeing the plan that will get us where we need to be. Uh, but until that time, I, I think it's better to keep our powder dry, get some more information, and uh, not act in haste. And, and haste being a very relative, I, I'm talking about geological time haste right now. So that's, that's your argument number five, Ms. Gill, that I anticipated. No, I just had one more point is that I just wonder if we're all considering the information. And I, I, this is a very difficult thing to talk about because we have information that we can't disclose and information that we received this week that I find to be very pertinent to this discussion, um, which, as I said, further solidifies my sense that this is not, you know, we've said, like, we're probably not going to go down this route. Um, so it begs the question, why put it off two more weeks when this is an inevitability? Um, we're not going to get more information. We have, we have actually received a lot of good information, I think, this week about what will happen if we go forward with a detailed RFP. Um, and, you know, I think you know, we're kind of ignoring that at our peril and just pushing this off instead of, as, you know, Mr. Reininger points out, say no, and then what are we going to do next? Um, so, you know, just wanted to raise that well, again. And, and what I would say to that is a, a good survey of the options and their merits would make possible things that may not seem possible right now. And, and so for that reason, I think knowing what the lay of the land is, knowing what price points are valid for what scenarios at what time frames, I, I think we may have more options than, than one thinks. So would anybody else like to beat this dead horse one more time? All right. Mr. Kimball, would you call the roll? And, and could you please repeat the motion just so that we don't have any mistakes? And the motion on the floor is that the school board discontinue the PPEA process and not go forward with the detailed RFP. Good. Mr. Ankuma. Yes. Mr. Castillo? No. Ms. Gill? Yes. Mr. Lawrence? No. Mr. Reiten Reininger? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Okay. The motion passes. All right, next we come to future, okay, uh, future agenda topics. Mr. Castilla, before we, Sir. before we go forward, could we actually now have a discussion about next steps? Would it be something that was presupposed a little bit, but I think it's worth a further discussion about now that the school board has reached a conclusion, what do we do next? Or would you prefer to move the, discuss that at a future meeting? If someone would like to propose that, I, I, I think my question is we don't know. I'd love to hear the plan. So if you, would, if you would like and if the board is willing at a quarter of 11 to entertain that at this point. I, I, I'm in your hands. I'm happy to talk about some of the things I think we might do. The but sense I'm, of the board is? I, I, I just have a suggestion which is part of my reasons for voting against, for voting with the motion that we get alternative uh, quotes as in not not necessarily can we look at a design build or can we engage someone to to design us a building if we're going to decouple because it, it appears obviously we are going to do it we've just voted uh for for the for the motion and city council is as they informally ag agreed that they're, they're not for it so what are our options not another ppea but can we consider uh or can we request a design build RFP proposal or something that goes out to see what, 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 what comes in. We're decoupling, so can we find somebody to say, build us a school, what will it cost? And, and maybe what we say is, here's how much money we have, what can you give us with this budget? Now, I, I, believe, I, I, I don't know how we do that, but. I believe we need about $7 million for a design build process. 
so be it. But maybe that forces us to ask, do we go to UVA and give them a check and say, how much for that building? You know, this, this, I think what this process does, or what we've just done, is going to force us to, to act quickly, back by service presentation. I mean, that, that's, that's where I'm coming from. We have to do something, in the words of Mr. Webb. So maybe this is a good thing. Uh, I've always maintained that crisis is a terrible thing to waste. So, you know. Well, I wondered if Mr. If Mr. Horn and if our if our joint legal counsels, you know, we did we did see some different scenarios during. I can't remember what what we saw that was that was not based upon the information that we had from the proposals that we could maybe go back to. You're talking about um, we, items I of affordability, looked, construction costs. Yeah, we looked at some decoupling options, um, or we, we looked at some tax implications of decoupling options. Right. I don't know how much of that we can now pull back out and say, okay, this is done, this is separate. Yeah, well, I think it's a natural step okay. now for uh, the city attorney and I to look at the materials that will be available now that this process is over those that must be returned, those that must be maintained confidential. Um, but I think the materials you're talking about were specifically prepared to be in open session, so we'll okay. get those back out. Okay, great. I mean, give us a starting point. I mean, for what it's worth, I had conversations with someone in the development community and an architect over the weekend asking about this same $7 million price tag just to design a school. And, you know, my understanding was smaller firms, not the high-priced ones, had been used in the past in other counties. So maybe we'll look at some of those options, but we're, we're, we're going to have to do something different, I guess is, is where I'm coming from. And in the same way we were shaved, well, a million bucks were shaved off our proposed request. Maybe we shave something off and say, here's what we have. Can you help us and put it out? It may not be the best building, but it, it, it doesn't have to be the cheapest building either. We'll get something. Up. But at least we get to act. Here's, that's where I'm at. So, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Ridinger. Thank you, sir. Um, <coughs> it, it strikes me that based on my admittedly far more limited experience with um, the board than most of the other people on the dais, that it's awfully hard to sort of work through these even in a work session. And that I'd suggest we you know, stand up, and I, I was not here for the joint planning committee with the city council, but that we stand up some sort of, you know, I don't know if it's a planning committee or a tiger team that involves representatives from FCCPS, the city, at least someone from the city council and someone from the school board, someone from the planning commission, and bring in some concerned citizens to sort of and I don't think we need the seven million dollar plan, but we need the what are the options? You know, if we if we do phased construction with an eventual possible sale of the land or not? You know, what if we use it for a less valuable use, like an aquatic center with some development? I mean, I think I think we need to get to what Mr. Ankuma said, and I think we need to get there as quickly as possible. I don't think the timeline that was originally what was delivered about a week ago at the the joint open session with the city council probably is realistic, but I think we need an accelerated planning effort um, not occurring within the confines of a school board or a city council meeting, but a joint effort that starts be by being informed, as Ms. Oliver said during the joint session, by what can we actually afford? Because I think that will drive us in the direction of phased construction or um, a renovation of the high school, and I, I just I think we need to go down that path as rapidly as possible, having now closed off at least one vehicle as opposed to one alternative. Other comments? I think at this point it's probably best to caucus with our colleagues, see what their thoughts are. I, I don't I don't have much more to think about that at this point. Uh,
Anyone else? Correct. Because I think the question of what can we afford, the answer is it depends. Do we borrow all the money? Do we do a phased construction? The answer is there are many options. Um, with respect to making haste to try to figure out which option, I, 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 I honestly don't know the answer to that as I, as I said earlier. So um, I, I guess the answer is also I would respectfully suggest that for all the expertise that our bodies have, we will need the advice of people who do this for a living and that will require budgets and expenditures of funds and we need to identify and engage those people to <coughs> to advise us and at that point I think then we can lay out a plan for moving forward any other comments Future agenda items is our next item. We have a handout talking about what's on the list. We can cross off a few other things. To, oh, we ones. crossed. I did them already. Okay, the pink ones have been pre-cleared. Um, would anybody have any other additions? I would respectfully suggest that we should be judicious about this, given that we've now taken on a significant new task in the form of phase V2.0 of, uh, of the high school project. Um, but happy to uh, see if there's anything that gets the board's attention and interest. All right, seeing none, we will go now to the superintendent's report. Um, since it's late, I will be just very quick. Just want to point out a couple of things. Um, we did have a great week, um, last, la a great time in, down in Radford uh, with boys and girls soccer both winning. So I'm channeling Margaret since she's not here because she always does the sports stuff. Um, also, just congratulations to our girls lacrosse who were in their first ever um, state final, ended up uh, uh, runner-up in the state. So that was fantastic. Um, TJ has had their field day. Um, Gertie had her birthday at the preschool, which was, you know, this is that first full year they've been in the building. So this is their first big annual birthday party. Um, I also was um, delighted to be at the Cappies um, on Sunday night. And uh, we did have uh, Lydia Gumper, who won the critics, one of the Critics Awards. And Lawrence was there presenting, as well as Margaret also presented at the Cappies this year. Um, and then today, we also had a personalized learning tour at MEH and GM. We had about 11 or 12 people that actually showed up. Um, but it was a fantastic visit and an opportunity to really see what goes on inside the building. And there was another um, student and teacher panel today different kids and it actually had some sixth and seventh graders on there and it's just always that's always my favorite part just kind of listening to them but um, lots of great things going on and obviously preparing for graduation on the 22nd that's what it's all about so um, it's getting children from preschool all the way through graduation and that's our favorite event of the year so hopefully most of you will be able to attend Constitution Hall is just beautiful so that's it for me Thank you, Dr. Jones. Um, next on the agenda is board and student liaison comments. Mr. Perez, why don't you kick it off? Okay, uh, it's the end of the year, so we've wrapped it up pretty nicely. Finals are coming up next week. Uh, graduation, as Dr. Jones said. Other than that, besides the amount of sports that, again, Dr. Jones also mentioned, uh, the only thing that's actually been pressing that's been noticed in terms of the high school is the administration, Dr. Bird, Mr. Healy, are currently reviewing the senior privileges policy after noticing a certain amount of abuse that has gone into the senior privileges and their ability to sign themselves out and how they've been, how that's been impacting the amount of classes that has been missed. So besides that, there is nothing else from the end of the George Mason High School. Thank you very much. Uh, why don't we start from left to right, Mr. Ankuma? Um, I was at the, uh, yeah. I was at the uh, last uh, uh, George Mason PTSA uh, meeting. I think this, this was the handover from the 
old administration to the new one. Um, obviously, the focus is all night grad, so they're pretty busy with that and uh, looking forward to next week after, right after the graduation ceremony. So that's got going on. I um, uh, was at the chamber board meeting this morning. Um, obviously, they had also just uh, d d wrapping up the, for after the gala, but it, Phil Duncan obviously explained a, a lot more about the decision to the, the vote yesterday regarding the uh, the, the schools and and wh how the that turned out because that was when I heard more about about that uh, more about uh, our, the decision we ju you just took regarding the schools at the board meeting this morning. Um, Peak uh, is meeting again next week for the for the end of the season, so looking forward to that and wrapping up. And gifted and talented, I believe they had a new well they they, they reapproved. I guess I, we actually approved the gifted plan in the minutes today, so that was one of their highlighting achievements for the for the for the year. Um, but that's about it for now. Thanks, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, just real quick, the uh, foundation board meeting was last night. They mostly went through talking about the gala, which was a, a huge success. They had uh, more money raised, more people showed up, and uh, I think what. Cecily and Debbie like best was more people they had not seen before and they didn't recognize showed up. So new people, um, it's always a good thing and uh, they raised a lot of money like always. That's it. Mr. Webb. Uh, just real briefly, um, piggybacking on Dr. Jones, uh, the Cappies was the first time I was able to, to attend and do this. Uh, and it was a great event to see not only uh, George Mason and the, the students who were nominated for their great work in the theater, but just to see the level of talent that is in this region was um, was very uh, exciting to see that. And again, to, to see how important it is to keep the arts programs and music within uh, as an important part of the education system that we have here. I know in Falls Church, we do a great job, but we also have been the parents who are able to help even at the younger uh, grade levels be able to get that love of music and and theater and arts um, started. But to see that level of, of great ability that those students had from all across the region. And of course, seeing our student uh, win an award uh, was always is a, a plus when you're sitting there in the audience and seeing your students uh, being recognized for their work is always good as well. But it was a great opportunity. and I would encourage any of you to fit it into your time to be able to do, uh, to definitely do it. Um, I was happy to see a couple of us, including um, Dr. Jones and Ms. Ward, and um, Mr. Ben was also there. But um, you see every level of, of folks from different levels within, particularly Fairfax County, was well represented, and I think that's because of their one of their board members being one of the co-directors of the program, but it's a great opportunity to just see some great work that kids do. Um, so I encourage you to do that if you have an opportunity. Ms. Gill. Um, I don't have any um, board or committee comments, although I did pose a challenge to everyone, and if you did not respond to my email, um, I will see you at 5.45 tomorrow morning. No, um, I, will be at the, I, will be at, I will be at the bottom of Robinson and Rosemary tomorrow for a um, training program so if you'd like to join me you may um, and if you decide I won't advertise the challenge if you decide you'd like to I'm happy to come up with a plan for everyone thank you mr. Reitinger uh, thank you mr. chairman three quick items one uh, I attended last week the Mary Ellen Henderson middle school uh, PTS PTSA meeting that was fascinating um, the majority of the meeting was taking up in a uh, social media tutorial for aged parents by several teens um, and it was a uh, it was eye-opening to say the least um, so it might be something that we could consider for a future meeting when our agenda slows down um, the second thing is just a note and I also did not want to put this on the future agenda list because the list is already too long but um, the there's been a bit of rising um, public discussion lately about the school calendar and what we could do to shorten it so it does not last as long as it is right now. Um, I know that this is a, a unique combination of a two-week winter break and as late as possible a school start, but 
there at least seems to me to be a rising sense that you know some people might the number of people who want to start school before Labor Day and get a waiver may be increasing. Um, I don't know, but I think it's it's worth at some point maybe asking someone to take a look at engendering some public discussion. Maybe one of the PTSAs could hold a forum or one of the groups just to have some discussion to drive um, that question forward without the board spending a lot of time on it. Um, and the last question is, I, I or the last comment is, I, I did receive Mrs. Gill, Ms. Gill's <laughs> challenge, um, and I, I, if asked to run, I will not run. If told to run, I will not run. But I will walk in the run for the schools. Thank you. Yeah, and I, I have an, an allergy to, to running, but if Ms. Gill would like to uh, do a brevet with me on bikes some sometime, we can do 200 kilometers together sometime. Um, I, I agree the uh, Mr. Perez raises some interesting issues about the privileges being uh, uh, perhaps abused at George Mason and I think that may reflect on the calendar and how it's uh, arrayed or maybe it simply reflects how s seniors uh, are treated in in the calendar rotation. Um, perhaps there are other ways the externships and other ideas I think are, are productive, but I, I think it's always good to take a look at the calendar. I think this may be a perfect storm this year given the two week winter break. Um, but uh, other than that, we can, uh, that, that's something that we should keep our finger on. And then of course the changing start date of Labor Day is always uh, an X factor. So, um, Looking forward to graduation next week and uh, will not give away any surprises about how that ceremony unfolds because it's always fun. And uh, looking forward to summer. Now we come to approval of minutes of which there are none and we are ready to adjourn. So thank you very much.